This is the sixth and final installment of a chilling true crime tale we began unraveling a few weeks ago. In today's case, the familial bonds are severed by a mother's calculated malevolence. It's a terrifying testament to the dark corners of the human psyche. Behind closed doors where shades of normalcy crumble, a mother's sinister plans unravel as she seeks to eradicate an obstacle to her grand design, which is the son-in-law standing in the way of her daughter's compliance. The motive, as twisted as it may sound, revolves around the warped belief that murder is justified when control over one's offspring and grandchildren is at stake. What compels a family to cross the unfathomable threshold from familial discord to premeditated violence? This question echoes throughout the chilling details of the crime which will forever stain the tapestry of this family's history. Two young boys who have lost their father at the hands of their own family will be changed forever. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 11. Today is part six and the final chapter of a case we began to explore a few weeks ago here on the Dark Livity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I'm here with my co-host, my boyfriend, my best friend, Jonathan. Hi. We're assuming you've already watched all five previous parts of this saga. But if you haven't, there's a link above in the cards and below with the whole playlist. I'm sure some of you are glad it's coming to an end and others probably wish we'd dive even deeper. But we are finally wrapping this up today, or at least for a while. We promise this time. And I also wanted to quickly address the audio issue that some of you were having last week. John, you're the expert. Well, from thinking about it, what it sounds like is a lot of headphones will take a stereo signal, like a left and right channel. And the ones that we were giving, given from the courthouse were in a mono signal. So I split it up to get rid of some of the extraneous sounds. And I think what the headphones are doing are basically flipping the phase of one audio source and then canceling it out. Because in audio, if you look at a waveform, it goes up and down, and that is what creates the waveform. So if you have two of the same exact waveforms and one's flipped, it's like one's at negative 100, the other's at 100, and right. therefore it equals zero, no sound. Yeah, so, so we're kind of what sorry about that. It yeah. wasn't something that we could really control because it's not our audio. So we're doing the best that we can. So people that were wearing headphones couldn't hear anything when it was driving us crazy because we knew the audio was there and there were thousands of people that could hear it because they were wearing it without headphones. So we're really sorry about that. Sometimes we can't help it because it's a third party audio, but we do our best. Everything today should be 100% able to be heard because we got it from Law and & Crime and you can hear our audio. Also, baby, yes, they probably heard our big announcement. Oh, they definitely did. On Instagram and our new channel. We have two big announcements. One is that we have a new channel. It's just a fun lifestyle channel where we just talk about our life, if you care about that kind of stuff. And it's called Actually Us. But we've also been keeping a secret. <laughs> it's been very hard for us to keep quiet about it, but it's true. We are expecting a baby. That's right. <laughs> so that has been something very exciting, but we don't want to go into it too much right now. But if you do care to learn more about it, you can always visit our Instagram or our new channel and we'll link it below. Yeah. So if you're curious about how we met and all kinds of things revolving our life, then go check out that channel. It's a little lighter than the content we bring a, you here. A little lighter. <laughs> okay, so now that we got all those announcements out of the way, when we left off last week in our last episode, we were telling you that Katie had just turned into a state's witness. She was set to testify at Charlie's trial, which began on October 23rd, 2023. And this time, the prosecution had what looked like a solid case against him. The prosecution team included Assistant State Attorney Sarah Dugan, who we introduced you to in the last video, and of course, Georgia Kappelman. For the defense, Charlie was represented by attorney Daniel Rashbaum. The prosecution's opening statements were delivered by Sarah Dugan. And we're going to show you a clip of that now so we can give you an idea of their case. The reason that we're here today is because the defendant in this case, Charlie Adelson, hired a hitman to kill his former brother-in-law, Dan Markell. This murder was set into motion because back in 2014, the defendant's family, the Adelson family, had a big problem. And that big problem was Dan Markell. 
And the solution to that problem was this defendant. This defendant was the solution to that problem because he had a girlfriend with connections to the type of people who were willing and capable of pointing a gun at a complete stranger and pulling the trigger. So she told the jury everything you should already know, how Donna Adelson hated Dan Markell and wanted to bribe or even bully Dan into allowing Wendy to leave. She explained how Donna spoke with Charlie several times daily and asked him to help solve Wendy's problem. She explained how Wendy and Dan's divorce was extremely contentious, and remember, litigation was happening between the two of them right up until Dan's murder. After Dan was erased from his son's life, no one from the Adelson family or Wendy ever called the Tallahassee Police Department to inquire about the case or even offer some cooperation. So somebody solved the Adelson family's problem. She explained to the jury that the investigation went into two separate directions. One was to identify the killers and the second was to identify the motive. Those two directions converged when they discovered Katie McBanwa. Miss Dugan went on to explain how the conspiracy to kill Dan worked. It's what they refer to as a train format, with one person only speaking to the person in front or behind them. Once they identified the two killers, Lewis and Sigfredo, they intentionally delayed arresting them to get the Adelsons to speak. At this point, the Adelsons believed they got away with murder. There was no reason for them to discuss it in person or on wiretapped phone lines. Therefore, the bump with the FBI agent was carefully crafted to give the Adelsons something to talk about. As far as the public knew, the only clue the investigators had was the mention of the green Prius, which was used in the crime. The FBI agent purposely only mentioned Katie, not by name, but mentioning Charlie's ex-girlfriend, and also mentioning Lewis's brother. They didn't mention the car or anyone else involved, including the Adelson family, and this was cleverly constructed. What was so interesting is that during the recorded phone calls, the conversation went exactly the way the investigators suspected, like a train. It only went in one direction. It either went from Donna to Charlie, Charlie to Katie, or Katie to Segredo, and back the other way. This was vital to understanding everyone's role. Never once did they hear Donna talk to Katie, for instance, or Charlie call Segredo. Now, when the defense attorney gave their opening statement, they dropped a bombshell, one that the prosecution wasn't expecting, but it did tell them one thing. They knew in order for the defendant to assert his defense, Charlie Adelson would have to take the stand. So of course, they were definitely preparing for a cross-examination of a lifetime. The defense began by telling the jury that they had the missing puzzle piece to Dan's murder. One of the things that became clear was that the defense was also defending two people who weren't indicted. Two people who weren't sitting at the defendant's table, but two people who would be talked about intensely throughout the trial. And I bet you could guess who those two people are. Wendy Adelson and Donna Adelson. In fact, throughout the opening statement and cross-examinations, the defense team often referred to Wendy Adelson as an unindicted co-conspirator. At times, it appeared that Charlie's attorney was actually defending Wendy more than he was defending Charlie Adelson. Attorney Rashbaum began by telling the jury that Dan Markell's murder was an utter tragedy and a loss to his entire family, his sons, and his community. But he explained, Dan wasn't murdered in a murder-for-hire plot. Instead, the defense argued Dan was murdered in an elaborate extortion plot by a nefarious character tied to a woman that Charlie had dated, good old Katie. According to the defense, Charlie had an attraction for exotic women with challenging pasts who are drawn to his affluent and flashy lifestyle, women who saw him through the lens of hero worship, who had dreams of becoming his wife and leaving their struggles behind. They saw Charlie as a solution to all of their economic struggles, and this formed the plot, the alleged plot of extortion. They asserted that Katie McBanawa was a single mother who struggled to pay her rent and provide for her and Sigfredo's children. She saw Charlie as her way out of the hard life. And within a few months of dating, she began asking Charlie to define their relationship. She wanted things to move forward and she wanted the title of girlfriend and later the title of wife. But when she saw that slipping through her fingers, she came up with another plan. The defense attorney told the jury that three killers had already been convicted in this case, Louis, Sigfredo, and Katie. There were no other killers to be found, and certainly not his client, Charlie. He 
was just an innocent pawn. Now, I have to say, I believe some of this. I do think that Katie saw Charlie as all of those things, and I think he wanted women to see him that way because he purposely chose vulnerable women that he could manipulate. And I do think Katie wanted more from Charlie. There's proof of that in this trial. She was always trying to impress him, impress his family, and hope that he would take their relationship to the next level. And I think that is why she even offered to help Charlie and his family with their family's problem, Dan. I just don't think she knew that Sigfredo and Lewis were not the guys for the job. They were messy, unprofessional, under the influence, and it's illegal. But at the center of all of this is greed, control, and selfishness. Each one of these people wanted something and were willing to break the law to get it. But in Charlie's defense, his attorney argued that the state is merely guessing how everything is connected, that those guesses led to assumptions, and the assumptions were wrong. He told the jury he loved jigsaw puzzles because the only way they worked is if every piece fit. And the state tried to force the wrong pieces together. He promised the jury he would show them why the puzzle pieces didn't fit. He told them two crimes occurred on July 18th, 2014, and the prosecution only knew about one. He said Charlie was very close to his mother and his sister, Wendy. He explained that Charlie was a traveling dentist who spent a lot of time in the car. And when he drove, he liked to talk, as well as repeat himself. The people Charlie spoke with the most were his mom, girlfriend, and sister. And Charlie was making and spending a lot of money. He was working hard, sometimes seven days a week, and when he could go out, he would flash a lot of cash, he drove his Ferrari, and gave the impression of being a wealthy bachelor. Around 2012, Wendy began confiding in Charlie and told him that her marriage was in trouble. She was unhappy, and she was going to marriage counseling. She told him she was considering a divorce and wanted her brother's opinion. Charlie said he wanted her to be happy, but she has to decide. The defense claimed he had nothing to do with Wendy's divorce. He was only interested in supporting his sister emotionally. First of all, the jigsaw puzzle defense was kind of lame. I think it was a nice try on being creative, but this isn't the time or the place. And of course, he told the jury about the TV joke. Ugh, that's been the center of a lot of this mm -hmm. that sometimes Charlie would make and that he would make these inappropriate jokes all the time that only he found was funny. And if he found it funny enough, he would repeat it. He told the jury about his hitman and the TV joke that he repeated to friends, family, and the women he dated. One of those women was Katie McBanawa, but that the joke about the hitman and the TV is just one of the puzzle pieces that didn't fit into the prosecution's theory, which I think is not really correct, but they tried to make it fit according to the defense, and they made it appear that it was some kind of code. Really? I don't know. Like, this is a stretch for me. It's the prosecution making it look like the code. That's what the defense is saying. And it's not Donna? making it look like it's a code. TV is definitely a code. Because it's kind of laughable. We're going to play that back for you really quick. It's the part where Donna's like, this TV is going to be five. What is, can I just ask you, what do they ask for? Um, you know, I don't know. This TV was probably, TV was probably about five. They asked you for $5,000? Mm -hmm. So you're telling me the TV isn't a code. Sounds like it. It would mean that this bump was about a TV. Because if it's not a code, then she's really telling Charlie that they want a TV? Yeah, I don't think so. The defense is trying to argue that the TV doesn't mean anything else, and that's just pathetic. The defense admitted that Charlie's parents were upset that Wendy lost her motion to move to South Florida and were overly involved in Wendy's life. He also shared with the jury that Donna Adelson had a lot of really horrible ideas of how Wendy should get Dan to let her move to Florida. And she shared these ideas with Charlie. She included him in all of those emails. And when Charlie was bored and traveling from the office to office, he would share these things with the women he was dating. And like I said, that woman at the time was Katie. But the defense insisted that none of those crazy ideas included murder. They even talked about going to a lawyer, making sure it was legal to offer Dan $1 million to allow the boys to move to South Florida. So the defense attorney argued that the fact that Wendy rejected all of those ideas is proof that none of them were involved. Charlie also shared these horrible ideas with Katie, and he also shared 
how much money he had. And that's key. Let's listen, because this is what the defense is trying to argue, that this was the beginning of Katie's crime of extorting Charlie and that this was not a conspiracy. And remember how I told you Charlie talks a lot and repeats himself a lot? Well, when they were together, he did just that. He talked about his day. He talked about what was going on in the world. He talked about his family, which by the way, was a constant topic every single day. Because when Charlie's driving in the car every morning for an hour to work and an hour home, sometimes longer, he talked to his mom on the phone. And when he talked to his mom on the phone, what would be a topic of heavy conversation quite frequently? Wendy's divorce. All the problems in the divorce. They told you that. They told you that in opening. And what would Charlie do? He would tell these things to his girlfriend. And what were some of the things he told her? Well, he told her about the million dollar offer. He told her that he could pay it in cash. She said, that's a lot of money. He said, no, I have it in in cash. And I'm going to get it back. He told her several times the joke. Over time, you're going to see through text messages that Katie wanted a deeper relationship. And you'll see that Charlie didn't want that. You'll also learn, and the timeline is important, they meet in September, uh, they, they, they start dating in October of 13. You're gonna see that over time, it takes a couple months, Charlie starts to learn a little bit more about Katie's ex, Sigfredo Garcia. And what you're gonna learn is that Charlie Adelson never meets Sigfredo Garcia officially, but by all accounts, he was not a good guy. So his defense is saying Katie saw all of that money knew Charlie was good for it, and she began bragging to other people. And Sigfredo, who hated Charlie, got word that he had a lot of money. So what did they do? Well, the defense wants the jury to believe they took it upon themselves to kill Dan, knowing how much Charlie hated him. And then everyone would assume that Charlie and his family were behind it. And then Sigfredo and his men would threaten to come forward and lie, air quotes, lie that it was a hit if Charlie didn't pay them off and keep quiet. I think it's creative. I think it's a creative defense. And the defense also said that the night that Dan was murdered, Katie came over to Charlie's to comfort him and she arrived around 11 p.m. with a confession of her own. Let's hear the defense attorney explain. She says that a friend of hers had shot Professor Markell. She tells him over and over that she had nothing to do with it. But these people, she was talking too much. And her friend and these people learn about the problems that his family was having with Professor Markell. They learned about the million dollar offer and they got it in their minds to do this. As you can imagine, Charlie is, his life has just forever been altered. He asks, who are these people? She won't tell him. It's not safe for you to know. Screaming at her, she won't tell him. Charlie had a guess. You will hear in detail what happened that night. You will learn that Charlie Adelson was told if he didn't pay within the next 48 hours, he or one of his family members would be next. You will learn that Katie repeatedly said that she had nothing to do with it and acted distraught. You will hear how she said that she would help him. You will learn about the initial payment. It wasn't $100,000. It was more than $100,000. He had, took out everything he had in his safe. You're going to learn about that. The state doesn't know it. It was more money but you're gonna learn he didn't have a third of a million dollars. So he had to pay every month. They don't know about that either. Payments every month. Does that sound like a murder for hire? Or does that sound like extortion? You're gonna hear about these gifts and you're gonna learn that the gifts were just that. They were gifts. Because as time went on, he became more and more certain that Katie was not involved. He became more and more certain that she was helping him. And He wanted to keep her happy too because he needed her. He needed her help. I suppose Charlie's attorney crafted a pretty creative defense, right? I mean, he's saying that Katie received a payment every month because she was helping Charlie. She was making sure the killers didn't come after him. And as long as he paid, he was safe. He says he had to make payments since Charlie didn't have the entire $333,000. Later, the prosecution will call this murder by layaway, like a payment plan. We know that a few months after the murder, Charlie added Katie as an employee to the Adelson Institute, even though she wasn't an employee. It was to help her get medical insurance for her children. He also began paying her another $2,000 a month in cash for a total of $3,000. 
Charlie planned to keep paying this until the debt was paid in full. Defense attorney Rashbaum told the jury that if this were a murder for hire and not extortion, why would Charlie create a paper trail by paying her through the office when he could just quickly have given her a thousand dollars in cash? Well, I think it's because Katie asked to be on the payroll. So like you, you're going to do what this person's asking you to do. So it's almost like he had no choice because he had to follow through. And in both of these cases, whether it's the defense or prosecution, that still makes sense. Well, Rashbaum said these puzzle pieces didn't fit the prosecution's case and that Katie told Charlie he could never tell anyone and never discuss it or his family would be murdered. This explains why Charlie was talking in code during the recorded phone call at the Dolce Vita restaurant. And that bump by the FBI was really a second extortion to Charlie. But wait, I thought it wasn't a code. So right. now they want you to think it's a code at some point, but not at other points. The TV is not a code, but then he had to kind of talk in code. Right. And that puzzle piece doesn't fit to me. Mm -mm. The defense said that Charlie thought another gang member was extorting him. And that's why he didn't go to the police. But he did confide in his mother in case anything happened to him because he needed her help signing the checks to give to Katie. But they both promised to take it to their graves and never tell Wendy. They wanted to protect her from all this ugly truth at all costs. Oh, they're so nice for trying really? to keep it from Wendy. Poor Wendy. <laughs> yeah. So they were saying that the bump was an extortion upon an extortion. And the defense attorney even went so far to say that he agreed with a lot of the state's evidence and wouldn't ask their witnesses any questions. He said Sigfredo, Lewis, and Katie were all arrested in 2016, but Charlie wasn't arrested for another six years until 2022 because they didn't have enough evidence against him. They only indicted him when they convinced Katie, who had been sentenced to life in prison, to sign a proffer agreement without any specific promises to testify against Charlie. He told the jury that Katie had a motive to lie in court because it was the only way she would ever get out of prison and see her children again. He ended by telling the jury that case against Charlie is a case of guesses, assumptions, and lies from someone who was already convicted of murder, Katie McBanawa, someone who lied at two other trials to save herself. So why would she be telling the truth now? It really is quite a good argument. Mm -hmm. It even made me kind of pause and think about it after I heard it. Even with all that we know, I was like, could it be true? Could Katie have been so mad at Charlie because he didn't want more? He didn't want to marry her and maybe plan this with Sigfredo because they're criminals? I don't know. And they were trying to hang this over Charlie's head to get him to comply. But when I sat and thought about it, I thought of Occam's razor. When thinking of an explanation, the symbolist is most likely the correct one. And I know Charlie's a manipulator. His license plate even said maestro. It makes more sense that he would hire a hitman. And I don't think he cared about the paper trail because he thought he was so smart that he'd never get caught. Remember back to the Dolce Vita audio and all of his illegal concepts? That were all wrong? Yeah. The state presented the same case they had the other two times with a few new faces. For one, there was a new judge. I like him a lot. His name is Stephen Everett. And Wendy finally wore a different outfit this time. Her testimony was a very similar to what we've heard in the past. However, Wendy claims she met Dan in Washington, D.C., and didn't mention J-Date. And sometimes it frustrates me that the jury only knows what they hear within those four walls of the courtroom. But that's also a good thing with how much the media twists things. And then we have social media. But over the three trials, there's very little evidence against Wendy. Most of it seems circumstantial and weak as far as what has been presented. It's possible that Charlie and the Adelsons planned this murder behind Wendy's back, but we don't have all of that information. And as you will find out at the end of this video, there will be a huge bombshell revealed. And with that, we may learn much more. This is the third time that Wendy has testified in her ex-husband's murder trial. On the stand, she played dumb per usual and wouldn't admit to anything until the prosecution handed her evidence. She would simply say it's been 10 years and that she didn't remember. Wendy refused to answer any questions unless the prosecution had the document with context they could show her. This legal strategy minimizes the impact of her testimony against her brother. Sometimes she would spend five to six minutes refreshing her memory of things that seemed difficult to believe she couldn't recall, especially given the fact that this was her third time testifying against Dan's murderers. For example, the emails Donna had sent her, we probably know by heart, 
Yet Wendy is always surprised by them, as though she hadn't had years to examine them. Here, watch this part where Georgia asks if the divorce negatively impacted her family while showing her Donna's emails. So that paragraph, isn't that paragraph going into detail about how the issues surrounding your divorce and litigation is financially impacting in a negative way your parents' business? That's what my mom says here, yes. Okay, and it also says, additionally, this loss of income affects my family because my older brother, also a dentist, purchased the practice from my father in mid-July 2012. He has a monthly payment to make to my father based on the sale of the practice. It isn't fair to him to have decreasing monthly income statements from the practice due to my parents spending so much time here in Tallahassee. So this is an argument that your mom is proposing, right, to help you, give you an idea of what might persuade the courts to allow the relocation. Do you agree with that? Yes, that's what she was doing, yes. Okay, and she's indicating that both your parents as well as your brother have suffered financially as a result of you not being able to relocate. Yes. Wendy made each aspect of this argument her mom is proposing as difficult as possible to admit. She always answers that, oh, it's what my mom said, as though it's not what was really happening. But especially when Georgia asks if Donna was controlling. Listen and watch Charlie shaking his head in the courtroom while you're listening to this. All right. Is your mom overprotective of you? Yes. <laughs> All right. And is it fair to say she's... You know, a little on the controlling side. I don't think she's controlling, but she's definitely overprotective. Did she ever try to micromanage your life? Maybe, yeah. Did she have an interest in who you were dating and who you weren't dating and who you should be dating when you were I mean, single? I think she was usually disappointed that I wasn't dating more. And would your mom sometimes enlist your brother Charlie to convince you to do certain things in your personal life? Can't really think of an example of that. Uh, well, dating Dave was a big one on some of the materials I had. Yeah, people like Dave. All right, and your mom really liked Dave. Yeah, everyone liked Dave, but we were just friends. Okay. Um, did she try? So she would try to get Charlie to convince you to date a certain person. I don't think she was getting Charlie to convince me to date Dave. I think everyone liked Dave. All right. And would she try to get Charlie to convince you to do certain things as far as your professional life? What jobs to take? No, I don't she think so. Do would she try to get Charlie to do certain things like um, advise you on investment decisions, whether or not you were going to buy a house, for example? I don't think so. I don't remember that. Danny and I made that decision together. Um, once you had left Dan and you were living separately, did you look into purchasing a home here in Tallahassee? I did, yeah. And did your brother Charlie convince you not to do that? I don't remember him convincing me not to. The only reason why I didn't was because I was waiting on the money from Danny from the settlement, and he didn't pay it, so I couldn't afford the house. And your mom didn't want you to buy the house, did she? That's not true. My parents were looking to buy a house in Tallahassee as well. Okay. You see how Charlie is shaking his head when they're talking about Donna asking him to persuade Wendy to date a guy named Dave that they all liked, but that Wendy only saw as a friend. Charlie was just shaking his head like it never happened. And the whole part about her parents looking for a home in Tallahassee, that's not exactly true. In fact, once Wendy had lost the motion to relocate to Miami, she was the one looking into buying a house in Tallahassee. And Donna was frantically trying to get Wendy not to purchase that house. The implication by the prosecution was that her family knew something that Wendy perhaps didn't know. And that was that Dan Markell didn't have long to live. Charlie did, in fact, talk Wendy out of purchasing that home. He sent his mom a text message letting her know that Wendy would not be purchasing a home in Tallahassee. And Donna was ecstatic with Charlie's results and called him a miracle worker. A few months later, Dan was dead. That exchange was on Halloween 2013. Several other things happened that day. That's the same day Charlie allegedly asked Katie if she knew someone who could harm his brother-in-law. It's also the same day Dan filed a motion to have both Wendy and her attorney disbarred for fraud on the court. 
According to the prosecution, October 31st, 2013 was the day Donna and Charlie planned Dan's eventual murder. Yet when asked whether it was true that her family had more reason to dislike Dan than anyone else, she tries to explain this by saying, well, that was in the context of the hours upon hours the police were interviewing me. Let's listen to that. Didn't you say, you know, it's like my parents have more reason to dislike Danny than almost anyone else. Is that what you said? That is what I said. And that's because they hurt, he hurt you, right? And I was saying that in the context of talking to law enforcement for hours and hours and trying to help them figure out who might be responsible. Right. And who did you tell them might be responsible? Well, I told them many, many people, but are you asking about this particular moment right here? You told them your family might be responsible. Or potentially you? someone to do with a former student mm -hmm. or his current girlfriend. I mentioned lots of people that I thought could be responsible. Okay. And of the lots of people that could have been responsible, your family was one. Well. Yep. Because they might have done this thinking it would help you. I mean, that's what happened, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Your family had your ex-husband killed to try to help you, didn't they? No, that's completely untrue. Despite all of the evidence against her family, Wendy still denied that any of them could be involved in her ex-husband's death. You heard her say, that's completely untrue. Really? Because Charlie's sitting right there in the courtroom for this exact reason. She won't even agree with the obvious, even kind of insinuating that Dan, dead Dan, is a liar in this next clip, and that he is the one writing lies in this petition to the court to block Wendy from moving the kids to Miami. She claims that not everything in that petition is true just because it's in there. On page 82, it says the sole stated reason the wife seeks to relocate is so that she can be closer to her parents. Was being near your parents the sole reason that you wanted to relocate? No. It wasn't the sole reason stated in your petition? It wasn't the sole reason stated in my petition, and it wasn't the sole reason that he and I talked about before I filed the motion to relocate. Why was he so adamant and so confident that this was the real reason you wanted to be down there? I think there's a lot of things in these pleadings that are not true, so... Just because it says something doesn't make it true. Sure, but did he know that your mom was just grinding on this issue of trying to get you down there? He would have had no that, idea. He wouldn't have been, that wouldn't have been known to him? I don't think so. Hmm. But he was accusing you in these pleadings of all kind of stuff, right? I mean, I'm not saying it's too, but hiding financial assets, failing to disclose things kidnapping his kids in the middle of you know his business trip all those sorts of things right yes he said lots of things all right and you said a lot of things too there's filings going both ways that are pretty venomous would you agree with that i would not agree with that uh, yours were pleasant i'm not saying divorce filings are pleasant but mine were not venomous okay did your mother donna adelson re review the uh filing in which Dan Markella is accusing you of this theft and all this stuff? I don't remember if she did. What about the one where Dan Markell is asking that your mother not be permitted to have unsupervised visitation with the kids? My mom never saw that because after he filed that, he then asked my parents to babysit the kids. and My mom baked him banana bread, gave him a hug goodbye. So there so, was nothing truthful about that pleading that he filed, and my mom right. never saw it. Why do you think he filed that? He was really angry at me for leaving him. Okay, so he didn't really want to limit your mom's visitation with the kids. No, and he that's asked evidence. For her to babysit after he filed that. Evidence by the banana bread. I love Georgia's dry humor, and you'll hear more of that in this trial. But I laughed when she's like, "Evidenced by the banana bread." Wendy was lying to the jury here because the prosecution had an email that Wendy sent to a dozen people that had the motion attached, including her brother, Charlie, and her mother. Plus, we know Donna told Charlie everything. But when Wendy was being confronted with all this evidence, she said she didn't know if her mother even looked at that filing. And she tried to make it way less significant than it really was. Georgia suggested that Dan's murder was supposed to be a 70th birthday present to Wendy's father, Harvey Adelson. Did your dad get any big gifts for his 70th? I don't remember. 
did you, so there was no big lead up and discussion about some big gift that you were involved in at least? I don't remember, I'm, I don't remember if I gave him a present, I hope I did. Do you remember what anybody gave him for that birthday? I really don't. Was the murder of Dan Markell your dad's big gift? I, I mean, that's, of course not. That's a horrible thing to say. What about the, well, what about the grandchildren getting full unfettered access to the grandchildren? My Could that have been the big gift? unfettered access to their grandchildren always. Not when they lived in Tallahassee. Well, whenever they could come up and see them, they did. They were 50% of the time with, with Dan Markell, right? Sure, but whenever they were with me, they had full unfettered access. On the occasion that we're talking about Dad's birthday, was that one of the times that when you came back to Tallahassee, your parents rode with you and then rented a car and drove home in the rental car? It was. And how long a drive is that? It's about seven hours. During that seven hour trip or at any time when you were in South Florida, was there any discussion of a murder at all? No, absolutely not. Any discussion of what to do about Dan? No. Any further discussion about bribing, converting to Christianity, any of those strategies? No, that ship had long sailed. Any discussion on that trip about the pending motion to preclude your mom from having contact with the kids? No. There was a text message string between Donna and Charlie Adelson regarding Harvey's upcoming 70th birthday. Again, the two used coded language, even though it's not really supposed to be coded. And Donna asked Charlie if his father was going to get his big gift that year. And Charlie suggested that it was in the works and he hoped it would come through on time. Don even told Charlie to delete these messages. We know now that Dan's murder happened nine days after Harvey's birthday. The prosecution contended that Harvey's gift was Dan's murder. Some might argue it was a gift for Wendy too, since she was immediately able to move right back to South Florida after her ex-husband was killed. Yikes. As we said, a lot of the same people testified at this trial. Charlie's ex, June, Wendy's ex, Jeff, but there were a few new faces. One was a former employee for Charlie's dad's dental clinic. She was not only a receptionist at the front desk, but an assistant to Charlie himself. Her name is Erica Johnson. She worked there for a long time, about 11 years, and was very loyal to the Adelson family. She still respected and even loved Charlie. I could tell that even though this man is just sick for what he decided to do, I can't I can't deny the fact he's charismatic. And I can tell even by looking at his body language and just looking at him in the courtroom, he smiles, he laughs, he doesn't take things too seriously, even in court. Not that that's a good thing in this moment, but I can see why people would be drawn to him. We don't want to see the better parts of bad people, but I'm sure there were some good things and likable things about Charlie whether that was fake or not, we'll never know. But wait, because coming up, there's another witness who shed some more negative light on Charlie. But first, let's hear from Erica. As soon as she sits down at the witness stand, Charlie is all smiles. Here she comes. She smiles at him first. And then as she's sitting down, Charlie is just beaming. Erica's really being called to refute that Katie McBanoa ever worked at the Adelson Institute, just to drive that point home. But I think it was interesting how devoted Erica seemed to Charlie and his family. I also wanted so badly to know what her lapel pin said. I wondered if it had special meaning, if it had been maybe a gift from Charlie. Can any of you make out what it is? Let me know in the comments. Georgia asked Erica about an incident on June 1st, 2016, when law enforcement officers came into the office and asked for employment records for Katie. Erica said she didn't have access, and she knew Katie didn't work there, but she called the maestro himself, not knowing the phones were tapped. So let's listen. Did you work at the Adelson Institute for a number of years? Yes. For about how long? About 11 years. And were you employed there from uh, 2013 to 2016 during those years? Yes. And what was your job there at that time? Front desk. Okay. Were you also a, kind of worked as an assistant to Charlie Adelson and the front desk? Yes. Who at the Adelson Institute had access to employee records? The owners of the business. So the Adelsons? 
Okay. Um, meaning Donna, Harvey, or Charlie? Correct. When police asked you for the records, did you call Donna Adelson? No. Or Harvey Adelson? No. Did you call Charlie Adelson? Yes. Okay, and when you called Charlie Adelson to let him know that law enforcement was there and what they were asking about, did you uh, step away from them a little bit to the back of the office to make that call? Yes. Now at the time, did you know that the call was being recorded? No. Have you had an opportunity to listen to that call in prior proceedings and also before court today? Yes. And was it your and Charlie Adelson's voices um, in that call? Yes. From your memory, is it an accurate recording of that conversation that day? Yes. Hey, what's going on? Hey, the FBI is here asking for records for Katie. Um, for what? Um, that she that she works here. Um, I would, um, I wouldn't. Uh, get anything. Yeah, I mean, and they, I don't know. the ex, the ex, did she work out? I was like, yeah, she works there, but I don't know what you want. Because remember, Erica, we sent that. Erica, Erica. Yeah. Do me a favor. Um, I'm not there right now. Uh huh. And I'm in surgery. Uh huh. But it's not my office, it's my dad's office. Mm -hmm. So I can't give anything out. Why? So you, I mean, you know, I don't have access to it. I don't know where anything is. Okay. So you don't have, you don't have access to anything. So don't I, know would, I don't know where anything is either. Yeah. So I would do this. I would not, um, I would not speak to anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you could, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I don't, it's my dad's office. Yeah. So I don't have access to, to any of that stuff. Okay. So they can talk to my dad and I'm sure they'll be able to get whatever they want from them. Okay. Understandable. So if I, if I had it, I mean, listen, you can talk to whoever you want. I shouldn't say don't talk to anybody. Um, no, you know, I'm going to do whatever you can. Yeah, anyway. I mean, no, 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 I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't say don't talk to anyone. <laughs> talk to whoever on the planet you want to talk to. Um, but it's not my office and it's not your office. Right. So you don't have uh, records to give them and I don't have records to give them. So I'm sure they'll be able to help them out in any way um any way they can okay so that's what i'll tell them tell them that yeah tell them that it's it's not i mean it's not my office the office was sold back to my dad actually a, right. a long time ago so tell them that you will so it's actually you're talking to the wrong dr adelson right 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 so what you need to do is tell them that you will get in contact so tell them uh I mean, it's not your office. You can't get that right. No, yeah, they said within 20 days of the Florida, Florida statute, provide above cause uh, with reason. Are they, are, they, are they there now, or do they just stand They're there, but you know, I'm in the back. I'm in the back. They're just waiting for me to come back. Oh, and they want records? Yeah. Do me a, do me a favor. I'm going to call you from a landline on your cell phone, okay? Okay. okay. All right, bye. bye. We heard you say at the beginning of the call, um, you're – referencing Katie. When you said Katie, were you talking about Catherine McBanois? Yes. And how did you know Catherine McBanois? She was a patient at the office and his girlfriend. Okay. A patient at Adelson Institute and Charlie Adelson's girlfriend? Yes. Had you ever seen Catherine McBanois work at Adelson Institute? No. Did Adelson Institute have a cleaning service that came? <laughs> yes. And was it a husband and wife team that cleaned the office? Yes. And was Kate, Kate, um, Catherine McBanwell part of that husband and wife team? No. See how she said Katie did work there when she's on the phone with Charlie? And he conveniently asked to call her back from a landline and to call her cell phone. And of course, we don't have those calls because those phones were not tapped. But she admits Katie didn't work there and that Donna handled the payroll. 
But there's more, as we said that there was some loyalty here, which comes in when Charlie's attorney cross-examines Erica. Let's listen to that. And the reason why you called him is because his parents, Harvey was out of, and Harvey and Donna were out of town, right? Yes. The reason why you went to the back of the office when they came is because there were patients in the office, right? Correct. And you were nervous about this all going on with patients in the office, right? Absolutely. And Charlie, when he called you back, that was his big concern, right? The patients yes. being in the office, right? When he called you back, was there anything crazy that he told you? I don't know, nothing. And when he would work there, he'd work mostly with you, right? Yes. You liked working with him, right? Loved. Loved. And uh, you'd work late at night? Yes. And sometimes you'd go out to dinner late at night after, right? Yes. First, he wanted to make sure the jury knew that there wasn't anything crazy being said when Charlie called Erica back. But then he asked if Erica liked working with Charlie, and she said, loved. Loved. She loved working with him. And the camera pans over to Charlie, and sure enough, he's sitting there smiling. Then Charlie's attorney goes on to ask if Erica used to work late and go to dinner with Charlie after hours which he did, and it was the reason that Katie got into fights with him because he'd be out with Erica at dinner. But then the defense asked if Erica continued to work with Charlie after all the allegations. Let's hear what she has to say. By the way, you say you loved working with Charlie Adelson. Uh, did you continue to work with him after the allegations in this case? Yes. Did you ever worry about working with him? No. You continued to work with him until he got arrested, correct? Correct. And you can see she's just smiling and even waving as she's leaving the courtroom. What do you think of that? I mean, I said that I think he's charismatic and we know that he's a ladies man, quite the charmer. And that brings us to this next witness that we wanted to showcase, which is an old friend of Charlie's. But what do you think? I mean, this person has worked there a long time. She practically maybe like grew up knowing the, the people that she's working with. It's over a decade. Yeah, it could be that. Maybe they, you know, had a little inner office romance, a little quid pro quo. I mean, I don't know about that. Yeah, I think knows? that they were more professional, but I just think maybe being there as long as she was, you see the best in people. And maybe you can't believe that they would be involved in this. Right. And I'm sure that he treated all his employees great, mm -hmm. right? As we've known before that he was very generous with the things he had and True. he was very nice to the people he liked. And I think we're going to hear from someone right now and this is a guy friend. So his charm didn't exactly continue to work on his guy friend. So I do think it's important to get a perspective on Charlie from the outside. Someone who actually knew him. And this witness is Ryan Fitzpatrick. And before we show you this testimony in court, I think it's important to provide some context about who Ryan is. Because he's actually said in interviews that he did following the trial that he was given a lot of crap for this testimony. Mostly because he remained Charlie's friend for a bit after Dan's murder. But as he explained on a couple podcasts he was on, Dan's murder wasn't even talked about by Charlie. There was nothing happening or known for a long time. And once it all came out, his perspective finally changed. Ryan is also a little rough around the edges. And later, when we do show you him on the stand, you'll hear some of the statements he made they weren't exactly very nice, even though Charlie's on trial for murder, conspiring to commit murder, and many people dislike him. There were a few things in particular that people took issue with in Ryan's testimony, but let's not jump ahead. Ryan did an interview with Judy, the YouTube lawyer. I don't think we need to play too much of it because I'm just going to break it down for you, but I will let him speak for himself so you can gauge his personality. He explained to Judy that he and Charlie met through friends while they were both in college. They went to different schools. Ryan went to the University of Florida and Charlie went to the University of Central Florida. He said that Charlie was very giving, generous, and he did a lot for people. Charlie, a uh, successful, charismatic guy, uh, the maestro or whatever, a uh, little bit annoying, a little bit arrogant, but he was fun to be around. Charlie was fun. Charlie was a great guy surface value you know i mean this is horrible but a lot of people didn't know charlie but you know it it's horrible what happened but uh 
you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. We just started hanging out and became buddies. Was it genuine? He doesn't know now. But Charlie was a fun guy. This was back around 2012. It was more of a party, social, like surface level hangout with Charlie at the time. But as time went on, they became like best friends. And that's mostly because they went into business with one another. Charlie, as we've said, had a lot of money and he would invest in businesses. For example, this is something I didn't know. Charlie owned a bagel place called Nosh. He was an investor. And then Charlie ended up running a legal funding business, according to Ryan. And Charlie extended some funding to Ryan. Eventually, Ryan was working in an office behind where Charlie did some of his surgeries. So they were very close. When it came to women, Ryan confirmed what others have said. That Ryan never took any of the girls Charlie dated very seriously. He mentioned Charlie dating what he referred to as low-hanging fruit. And maybe these types of women, in his perspective, were easier for Charlie to manipulate. Ryan mentioned meeting Katie only in passing and didn't pay much attention to any of the girls Charlie had around. He didn't care because he had so many of them, and it was actually kind of annoying to Ryan. Ryan said he never had a substantial conversation with Katie, and that now he can see that she's a pathological liar, so he doesn't think you can actually have a real conversation with someone like her, and that Charlie wasn't good to the women he was with. That's sad. I wonder why they stayed around. Was it money? I don't know. The flashy lifestyle? Or maybe he just hadn't found the one. I can tell you why I think that later if I remember, but let's listen to Ryan. Only met Katie in passing, and to be honest, I didn't pay attention to any of the girls that Charlie had around. It was just like, whatever, you know, like, Hey, how you doing? I'm not like, Hey, I want to get to know you. I didn't care because it was just, he had so many, right? Yes, he did. The maestro did. Yes, ma'am. And it was just annoying to me. I was like, I don't want to get to know this person. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if you could have substance with a pathological liar like her, you know what I mean? I mean, Mm -hmm. she's all over the place. Three different stories. Every time she testified, it was like, what are you talking about? But now you're here to tell the truth. Yeah. Hey, bro, uh, is that the third extortion or the second extortion? I'm not sure. I can't figure that out. Hey, low hanging fruit, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe the good looking ones or the nice ones wouldn't fall for his uh, bullshit. So remember earlier I said, there's a reason why I think that maybe it was because he didn't find the one because eventually he did kind of settle down and have a child with someone. And it seemed like, from things I have heard later on in phone calls and whatnot, that him and his new girlfriend, person, partner were really into each other. So it could have just been that he hadn't found the one yet. Mm -hmm. Things began to change with Charlie over time, especially after Dan's murder. Even though no one talked about it at the time, Ryan said, looking back, there were changes he saw in Charlie. For one, the fact that no one mentioned Dan's murder seemed a bit odd. Ryan says he still can't believe it's real that someone would have a person murdered over a custody battle. But as we all know, Being viewers of true crime, it happens a lot, a lot more than people think. The first time Ryan noticed anything odd with Charlie was when the first arrest happened when Sigfredo went to jail. Ryan was in the back office, Charlie was doing surgery, and he recalls Charlie freaking out. That's not the reaction you'd expect if your sister's ex-husband's killer had been caught. Charlie was acting nervous, and as time went on, Charlie kind of pulled away and began acting more self-absorbed, and what Ryan called narcissistic. Ryan's example is that Charlie wouldn't just call you up and ask how you were, it was all about him. He also began seeing the signs of manipulation, like, oh, I'll do this for you if you do that. It was always for Charlie's benefit. He tried to manipulate everyone. Ryan called it a habitual behavior trait, but it wasn't until Katie got arrested that Ryan started thinking Charlie was involved. His behavior was nervous, erratic, much like a guilty person. This is when Ryan really began noticing a difference in Charlie's demeanor. As things progressed, Ryan began to realize that he had been fooled. He couldn't see Charlie as someone capable of something like this. He said, you can't really judge someone, but Ryan feels naive and almost believed Charlie's BS. Ryan was his buddy. It was hard to realize that someone you cared about so much was a narcissistic sociopathic monster who did such a horrible thing. It's like being in an abusive relationship. You think about the good times and not the bad things that happened to you. Ryan said he's not the person he used to know. I was with Charlie uh, working the day, I think it was October 2016 or May of 2016, something like that. I was with him the day 
and he was in surgery and I had an office in the back of the dental office that he was doing surgery in. And I, um, he, he freaked out and I was like, what's going on? And he's like, Oh, so-and-so just got arrested. I was like, here we go. Here we go. And it was just miserable being around him after that point, moving forward, looking back with some of the comments that he made and things that he said, I mean, I, we knew, we knew. And I mean, he used to travel. I mean, I've been around the world with him, but there were times when he was out of the country and we would be like, don't come back. Like you're going to prison. Like it's extremely obvious what you've done, you know, with his behavior and his agitation and his nervousness. Like it was just, it was annoying. Yeah. It was horrible. Hard to be around him. It was annoying. He was agitated, very self-centered, very, uh, narcissistic, very, just everything was about him. You know, he would never call me up and say, Hey, how's your day going? It was about him and his problems. And I would be like, well, you created these problems. Like, you know, your problems are what you made for yourself. So it, it was a very labored relationship. I experienced the manipulation, you know, later in our relationship as well. So just the manipulation of like, Oh, I'll do this for you, but you're going to believe my bullshit or you're going to listen to my crap and you just feel like whatever, you know, like I, I'm just saying it was a, a, a personality trait that he had where it was like, in you mentioned the control, it was manipulation. Just like he tried to manipulate all of us in court. He tried to ma- manipulate the cops. He tried to manipulate June mm-hmm. and you know, I mean, it's, it's just a habitual behavior habit. Yeah, I can tell Ryan really did care about Charlie. And it is shocking, like he said, to realize that Charlie isn't the person you thought he was. That would be a huge blow. You might even begin to look back and question everything. But the part of this interview that I personally found intriguing was when Judy asked about Charlie's family. Ryan wasn't super close to Charlie's parents, and he only met Wendy a few times in passing. But with what he did know, he said when he met Wendy, he thought she was hot, smart, but superficial, elite, and above everyone else, or she acted like she was. But he mentioned smart, and he wanted to make sure that it was clear that she was like genius level in his perspective. That means something to me. I mean, I can tell you everything Wendy has achieved. She's no dummy. Ryan said he also thinks the whole family knew what was going on with Dan being killed, that there's no way as smart as they were that they wouldn't have been aware of what was happening. That's telling, but I think we already know that. When Ryan was specifically asked if he thought Wendy was guilty, he said yes without hesitation. His biggest reason was that Wendy took that three-mile detour to buy whiskey and pulled up to the crime scene. Let's hear him explain that. Do you think Wendy is also guilty? Yes. 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 Because why? Because she's guilty. <laughs> okay. Based on since you've been watching all the trials, well, watching all the YouTube you know, videos. I mean, I'm so sorry that you took a three mile detour to go buy bullet whiskey and you pulled up to the crime scene. Oh, yeah. Explain that, Wendy. No, mm-hmm. I think she's a piece of sh- like the rest of them, and she's guilty just like Donna is. And hopefully Georgia Kappelman will continue her amazing job of prosecuting these criminals. Mm-hmm. She's definitely guilty. I think she's the mastermind. But no, I don't remember. <laughs> Look at me. Yeah, I think that's when I realized that I didn't believe her anymore. Because I was convinced at first that she was innocent in all this. But there's just too much for her to not have known, in my opinion. Ryan said he thinks Wendy is the real mastermind and that she hung Charlie to dry in the first 20 minutes. In that first interview with police, she just threw him under the bus. Especially when Wendy said on the first day of her testimony in this trial that this was the first she'd ever heard of the extortion. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Absolutely, I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired them, right? Not necessarily. Somebody paid them. I learned something this morning. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I don't know if people caught on how pivotal that statement was to showing that she was throwing Charlie under the bus. 
Because if she didn't know anything about this extortion, it's as though it didn't exist. And that was her brother's defense. Ryan hopes that Georgia Kappelman will bring everyone to justice. And at the end, he mentioned Wendy's boys. As expected, Ryan reported they were smart little boys, they were handsome, and at only seven years old, I assumed it was most likely Ben, he said one of them beat him at chess. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, he did have Dan and Wendy as parents, and even Don and Harvey raised their kids to be outstanding academically. So we told you that Ryan testified against Charlie. He felt he had a duty to tell the truth. Ryan explained that he knew Charlie and grew close to him for the time they met in 2012 until Charlie's arrest, and that he was familiar with Charlie's parents. He knew that the family, including Charlie, were not fond of Dan Markell. When asked if Katie was more special than Charlie's other girlfriends, Ryan said no. She didn't stand out. The reason Georgia wants to make sure this is well established is that, remember from our last video, we explained Katie continued to receive gifts and money and was also on the payroll following Dan's murder. If she weren't any more special than his other girlfriends, it would be a payoff for the hit. We knew that they were not even together anymore. And Katie was back with Sigfredo in the months following the hit. One important aspect of Ryan's testimony beyond what I just explained was that the way Charlie kept his money how he found out about Dan's murder, and whether he had any knowledge of the extortion claims. How Charlie acted after Katie's arrest, and of course, Charlie's jokes. Let's listen. Do you, or did you at some time, have a relationship with Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. Were you guys friends? Yes, ma'am. How close were you? Very close. What time frame were you close friends with Charlie Adelson? From about uh, the time that I moved to South Florida, and around about 2012, um, and then as years pass, we grew a lot closer. Until when? Until about 2018, 19-ish. All right. Did you spend a lot of time together? Yes, ma'am. Did you talk to him daily? Yes, ma'am. Did you know his family? Yes, ma'am. Meet his girlfriends? Yes, ma'am. Was the defendant, Mr. Adelson, very close to his sister, Wendy? Yes, ma'am. If you know, how did the family, the Adelson family, feel about Dan Markell? Not fond. And did that include Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. I mentioned the girlfriends. Did Mr. Adelson have a lot of girlfriends? Yes, ma'am. Was one of them Catherine Magbanoa? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever have an occasion to meet her? I think in passing I might have met her once or twice, but I didn't have a personal relationship with her, no. Did she stand out to you as being someone special or of more importance to him than any of the other women Judge, in his life? Objection leading. I'll stay and please rephrase your question. It's, it's a yes or no question. Did she stand out to him as being somehow special or different from the other women in his life? No, ma'am. Are you familiar with the defendant's practice of stapling his money? Yes, ma'am. Do you know the denominations or how he would staple it? Um, 10 100s would be a thousand. Easier to count that way. At the time that Dan Markell was murdered, how did you learn of the murder? I, I can't remember. They never spoke about it, so. And when you yeah. say they never spoke about it, who was that? The family never spoke of it. So you didn't learn about the murder from your close friend? I do not believe so, no. Not directly. <clears throat> right after the murder, did Mr. Adelson tell you that his girlfriend, Catherine Magbanawa, was extorting money out of him? No, ma'am. Does that seem like something he would have mentioned to you? Yes, ma'am. Probably, I imagine so. Did he ever make a statement to you about murder? Charlie, as you've heard in testimony and depots, he made a lot of tasteless jokes, and he said something around the lines of, you can get away with anything, you can get away with murder, and you keep your mouth shut. When was that statement made? Jeez, I, years ago. Before or after this murder? It would be after. Are you familiar with the arrest that occurred in May? May of, 26, May of 2016, I should have clarified. Katie's arrest? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And did his behavior change at that point? Yes, ma'am. And did he seem relieved and less stressed out after she got arrested? No, ma'am, he did not. Um, what 
what was his demeanor after her arrest? Nervousness, uh, agitation, um, stress. So he seemed to get more stressed out after she was apprehended. Yes, ma'am. Was he weird like that before, like during the between the time of the murder and the time of Catherine Magdano's arrest? To say he was weird. Um, like that, like the no, behaviors you just no described. Man, not that weird. So there's confirmation once again that the money Charlie had was stapled, that he acted weird and nervous following Katie's arrest. And again, if you weren't involved, you'd be happy. You'd be relieved that the person who killed your scissors ex-husband was behind bars. But no, Charlie was worried because the walls were closing in. Plus, you heard Charlie's joke after Dan's murder that you can get away with murder if you keep your mouth shut. Well, he should have taken his own advice because all he did was talk to his family and Katie, code or not. But remember, we said there was something about this testimony that rubbed some people the wrong way. Well, Charlie apparently sued Ryan and some other people, but that lawsuit was dismissed. However, when Georgia asked Ryan if they had a falling out, he said yes in the summer of 2018 and that he's not a big fan of Charlie. But further, that he's not only said mean things about Charlie to his face, but also on social media. It was when Charlie's attorney cross-examined Ryan when things got a little heated. That's because Charlie's defense attorney came out the gate accusing Ryan of stealing money from Charlie, which led to that lawsuit. And that Ryan threatened to go to police and tell them Charlie was involved in Dan's murder if Charlie didn't drop the lawsuit. Isn't it true that you stole from Charlie? No, not at all. Okay. It's not true that you took checks that were supposed to be made out to the business and took them for yourself? That's alleged in a lawsuit that's been dismissed. So. Was that lawsuit dismissed because Charlie Edelson got arrested in I don't this know case? Why I never hired an attorney because I wasn't worried about it. When was it dismissed? After his arrest in this case or before? I found out last week, so I don't, I don't know. I don't care. Do you think it was arrest? Do you think it was dismissed after he was arrested in this case? I, that's speculation on your part. I have no idea. I didn't think about it. Didn't lose any sleep over it. Was a lawsuit for hundreds of thousands of dollars? About $2 million. But I don't have that anyway, so I didn't worry about it. Before he filed that lawsuit, he demanded that you repay him, right? I guess, if that's what he says. Well, did he text you and demand repayment? Yeah. He said he was going to start taking what you owed him out of your paychecks. Do you recall that? Yeah. And you didn't like that? No. <laughs> so, you thre so you threatened if he tried to recover any of the stolen for money for you, you would go to law enforcement and tell, him, tell them that, you were that he was involved in Professor Markell's murder. I don't know if that's what I said verbatim at all. I found this part humorous. I just want you to watch as Georgia laughs and smiles when Attorney Rashbaum brings his huge accordion folder of papers to her table to rifle through them and try to find evidence of this text message exchange between Ryan and Charlie. Even Sarah Dugan has a smirk on her face. I had to laugh at him bringing all of that to their table. Georgia mouthed, oh my God, he only needed one folder. So let's go back and see what he asked Ryan. Do you recall saying to Dr. Edel, uh, Charlie Edelson, I don't owe you shit. I'll be on the phone with the FBI today. Get your affairs in order before prison punk. You're going to rot in jail, you mom, fag. Do you recall saying that? I mean, if you're reading it, then I did. You open your mouth and I will open mine. Watch, motherfucker. You're a miserable Jew and you're going to get what you deserve. Do you recall saying that? If you're reading it, then I said it. I dare you to threaten me again. I'll be on the phone with the FBI before you blink, you murderer. Do you remember saying that? Yep. Get fucked. I'm going to get you in jail. Do you remember saying that? I guess if it's in, if it's in there. You ever heard of a website on Facebook called True Crimes Blog 
true crimes case, the Dan Markell case, let's discuss. You ever heard of that? Yes. You're just posting pictures of Charlie on that website this week, right? I don't know. You want me to show you them? What difference does it make? I don't, what does that have it to do with anything? May I approach your honor? Does this refresh your recollection of a picture you posted of Charlie on that website just days ago? Yeah, it's a good picture. You say you have nothing to gain from this case and you don't really care and you don't want to be here, right? Right. Just on Tuesday, do you recall writing to someone, I want to propose a wager. Let's see who gets involved. The over and under on life plus, laugh out loud. Yeah. Yeah. You posted on there that you were going to help get this man a life imprisonment, right? I don't know that it suggested that I was helping him do anything. I was just speak, speaking my opinion, which that's free speech, and that's what all the other idiots on that thing do as well. So, I want to propose a wager over, under, on life plus. That's what you said. Yeah. No further questions. I'm not really seeing the issue. I mean, calling someone names is a little immature, but all in all, calling him what he is, a murderer? I'm not sure I see the issue. I mean, if someone I trusted had been deceiving me all along, I'd be pissed. Right. However, resorting to name calling is pretty simplistic and unproductive. Exactly. So as you listened, Ryan admitted to texting Charlie and calling him names and threatening him to out him to the FBI if he continued to press him about the lawsuit. Again, what's the issue here? I guess it could make Ryan look like he knew the whole time and didn't say anything to the police covering for Charlie. But I think by the time these texts were exchanged between Ryan and Charlie, Ryan began to suspect Charlie was involved. Right. I can see why people took issue with that. I could also see why people took issue with the choice of words mm. that he used. Sure. But what about the social media posts and the bet? Well, on Facebook, on a true crime page, and I thought it was funny that Ryan was like, I was just another idiot on there making comments, and it's free speech, his words, is making a bet hoping that Charlie gets life in prison a bad thing when you have reason to believe, as we all do after everything we know, that this man orchestrated a killing of an innocent father? The audience can chime in. And if you didn't catch it, he was basically saying, let's bet that Charlie is going to get life plus. And now it's Luis Rivera's turn again. And we already know his side of the story, so we're not going to be playing the same thing over again. This time, Katie was the star witness against Charlie. And the prosecution did their best to rehabilitate her on the stand and explain why she lied under oath twice at her previous trials and two more times during interviews in prison. They know they have to make her likable to the jury so they'd believe everything she was about to say against her former lover. You're in jail clothes. Are you currently in custody? Yes, ma'am. What are you in custody for? The murder. Are you doing a sentence for murder? Yes, ma'am. You were convicted of murder? Yes, ma'am. And is that the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Did you have a trial in your case? Yes, ma'am. Did you testify? Yes, ma'am. You testified in your own on your own behalf? Yes, ma'am. All right. And when you testified, were you truthful with the jury? No, ma'am. I was not. Did you take the same oath that you just took today in your own trial? Yes, ma'am. What was your defense when you were tried? that I had nothing to do with it. All right, Did, that we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson and we got it right in reference to the killers, yes, but you weren't in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Was that true? No, ma'am, it was not. Were you in the middle? Yes, ma'am, I was. And didn't you also testify in the trial in which Sigfredo Garcia was convicted of murder? Yes, ma'am, I was. And what was his defense? That he had nothing to do with it. That we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson and we got it right in reference to the killers, but he had nothing to do with it. Yes, right? ma'am. Objection, Your Honor. Overrule this gentleman. Make sure you use any questions. And was that defense truthful? No, ma'am, it was not. So, Sigfredo Garcia was involved? Yes, ma'am, he was. So, why tell the truth now? I believe that the truth needed to come out now so that the family can get some type of closure. Why didn't the truth need to come out last year or the year before or the I, year before that? I was trying to defend myself. You were trying to get off? Yes, ma'am. 
So there it was. Katie had to admit to the jury that she lied under oath. She also had to admit that she had a pending appeal with the appellate courts in which she was still asserting her innocence. But she told the jury she was telling the truth now because she believed the truth needed to come out. Dan's family needed to have closure. And her primary motivation for arranging Dan's murder was purely financial. So how did it all start? Remember we told you that Halloween was a pivotal time in this case? Here's how Katie explained the plan being put into motion. So was this photo taken before or after the murder? Before. Who came up with the idea to kill Dan Markell? Charlie. So Sigfredo Garcia didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. Luis Rivera didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. When did the defendant first bring this idea up to you? My first recollection was around Halloween of 2013. Around Halloween or on the actual? On, on Halloween, yes, ma'am. All right. What, what, what's your recollection of how that came up? Um, we were at a Halloween party in Lincoln Road, and right before we were about to go, he got in the car with me, and he asked me a question. What was the question? Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. And at the time, what was your relationship with Sigfredo? It wasn't the best. But he was the father of your children, right? Yes, ma'am. So were you dating both men at this time, or were you only dating no, Charlie? No, I was only dating Charlie. Okay. And so he initially... He, meaning the defendant, initially said, do you know anyone that could harm someone? Was he aware of your connection to Sigfredo Garcia when he made not, that statement? Not that I know of, no ma'am. Did you suggest Sigfredo Garcia at that time to the defendant? No ma'am. What I, did you say? I just said yes and kind of left it alone. All right, did it go any further than that at that time? Not at that, not that night. I mean, did you so. know who he wanted harmed? Did at that time? No, ma'am. All right. Had you become aware during the course of your relationship with him that he had some kind of issue going on with his sister's ex-husband? Yes, ma'am. I did. What did you learn about that? He was just stating that his family wasn't. His mom and dad was stressed, and that his sister was having problems with her husband and custody of her two children. And when did you learn that the person that the defendant wanted harmed was this ex-husband of the sister? I believe later on. All right. And did you when did you learn the name Dan Markell? It wasn't until I don't know if it was on my trial or when Sigfredo got arrested. Okay, so even when he was killed, you didn't know the name of the person that was being killed? Yes, I never knew his name. How did the defendant refer to this person, if not by the name Dan or Danny Markell? Wendy's husband. Okay. So you knew that the person that was going to be initially harmed was Wendy's husband? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and you knew that there were issues, or what did you know about the beef with him? Um, that, I mean, he was just, he painted this picture that this was a terrible man and making his family go through a lot custody-wise with his sister. Right, and was, when he would say these things to you, is it in the context of his mom specifically or his family in general? I believe it was more towards his mom. Meaning what? That his mom hasn't been sleeping, his mom is not eating. I know his dad wasn't wasn't the best health either, but it was he would refer to his mom a lot. So there you go. According to Katie, it was all Charlie's idea. As we have thought, he wanted to make the problem go away for his family, especially for his mother Donna, whom Katie said Charlie mentioned the most. And Katie also admitted she never told Charlie who would be doing the job, as we suspected since she knew that both Charlie and Sigfredo hated each other. So that makes pretty good sense. Of course, neither would agree to this plan, but Katie was in it for the money, so she kept that part a secret. Katie said she never told Charlie who was going to be doing the job. Did you ever tell the defendant who it was that was going to be doing the job? No, ma'am, I did not. Why didn't you 
say the name Sigfredo to Charlie Adelson? I always referred to each other as my friend. Either neither one of them wanted to really hear each other's names. And is why is that? Uh, because Sigfredo was the my the father of my kids, and I was dating him at that time. I was dating Charlie at that time. Okay, so Sigfredo Garcia, did he have strong feelings about the defendant? Yes, he didn't like him. All right, and is that? because you were dating him yes ma'am okay and vice versa you're not going to talk about the child's father with the new boyfriend either yes ma'am okay so is it true then that you were sort of walling these two off from each other before the issue of the murder and the conspiracy ever even arose yes ma'am and did that pattern continue throughout the murder conspiracy yes ma'am it did do you think Charlie Adelson knew that it was your child's father that you were going to? He might have had an idea, but he just never said it out loud. Exactly. She knew that she needed to keep things secret. And this is really solidified here with this next clip. And at this point, this is July 1st of 2014. The, the plot is already underway to do this murder, right? Yes, ma'am. Does Sigfredo Garcia know that he's doing the murder for Charlie Adelson? To my knowledge, he might have had an inkling about it, but I don't know. That was never spoken of. Okay. The killers, and when I say the killers, I'm referring to Garcia and Rivera, knew they were doing something for a lady to get her kids back. Do you yeah. know how they knew that information? I believe it's because of the envelope that Charlie gave me to pass okay. over. So you didn't relay that information to them that it had to do with a lady and her kids? I might have mentioned it to Sigfredo, yes. Okay. So if you mentioned that to, to Sigfredo, would you be, I guess, were you intentionally trying to characterize this job as being related to someone other than Charlie Adelson? I believe so, yes. Because... Is that because Sigfredo Garcia would not have wanted to do anything to help out Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. So now that we've really made that clear, I think we can move on to when the hit was going to be carried out and also that paper that Katie referenced. You mentioned the paper. Luis Rivera said there was a paper that Sigfredo had when they came to do the murder. Do you know anything about that paper? No, ma'am, I don't. All right. Did you provide a paper to Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, I did. All right, and when you say you don't know anything about it, but you gave it to him, you obviously know something about it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so tell us what, I know what you're trying to say is you don't know what was on the paper. The content of it, yes. Tell, tell us how you came into possession of this paper that the killers had. Okay, one day, um, just a random night that I was over at Charlie's house, he had a manila envelope that was sealed. He told me, Katie, do not open it. Do not touch it. Do not look inside it. I didn't print this paper out from my office. Printed it probably from another office. And basically, relate, you know, give that paper to the other person. All right. And who is saying this? This was Charlie. All right. This defendant? Yes, ma'am. So he says to you, I have this paper. How does he give it to you? I had a diaper bag, so he showed me the envelope, and I was like, just put it in there. Did he express any concerns about fingerprints being on the envelope or the contents? Yes, ma'am. He said he wore a glove so that there's no fingerprints on it. He was, he told, he was very specific about me not opening it and not looking inside it. And he also told me that he didn't print it from his office. All right, and what about licking the envelope? And that he didn't lick the envelope. He said he did not lick the envelope? He did not lick the envelope. And what was the purpose of that? I guess his DNA. Okay. So did you touch the envelope? Uh, it was in my diaper bag, but I don't remember if I ever, I never opened it, but I might have touched it just to put, stick it inside in my diaper bag. And did... You deliver the envelope to Sigfredo Garcia. Um, I call, I contact, I must have contacted Sigfredo and just told them, hey, um, 
come by the house, and then, you know, he was kind of in and out of my life, so he'd pop up. He literally got the envelope. I was like, I, you have something inside that bag, and then he grabbed it, stuffed it in his pants, and left. So that explains the paper. I find it hard to believe she didn't know who was being killed, because according to her, she never knew Dan's name. She just had that envelope and gave it to Sigfredo. I know. I feel the same way. I think she knew much more. Right. But let's jump to the time frame where Georgia is about to say that all this started in October of 2013. And it happened July 2014. So Georgia wants to understand if there was any pressure put on Katie at some point to get it done. So let's play that. So this thing started back in October of 13 and doesn't get done until July of of 14 is there can you describe whether there's any pressure as time is going on and this thing is not getting done um trying to remember like in the beginning of the year i don't think there was really much i mean he was he's been planting this seed in my head that this needed to get done this needed to get done and i guess towards probably around June, July is when he was a little bit more adamant about this job getting done. Okay. And when you say he, you're talking about who? Charlie. Did you ever have any contact with any other Adelson about this job? No, ma'am. Georgia wanted to know whether Katie had ever spoken to Wendy or if there was a connection between them. Katie explained that she had met her a couple times, but they weren't in contact. They did not have a relationship. Georgia shows Katie a picture of her and Wendy together and asks her about this. Is this you on the left side of the screen? Yes, ma'am, it is. Right. And was this picture, where was this picture taken? This was in South Beach. Um, I believe the building that they were living at, at the where Charlie's parents were living at. Is that the icon? I don't, I don't think that was the icon. I, it was somewhere in First and Ocean. Okay, so a different residence. Yes, ma'am. All right, and this photo, was this the first time you'd ever met Wendy, or had you already known Wendy before this photo? I met her one time prior to this, because I believe this was in Father's Day. So I met her around spring break when I had dinner with her and uh, Jeffrey. Okay, so the Yardbird restaurant? Yes, ma'am. All right, so this was the second time you'd met her. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a relationship with her outside of her being Charlie's sister? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you communicate with her by phone or through any app apps or anything like that? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you receive any communication from her specifically about the homicide? No, ma'am, I did not. Did Wendy ever give you any money or other gifts? No, ma'am, she did not. Did anybody pay you for your part in the murder other than Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, they did not. All right, and the payments from Charlie Adelson, did those include the checks that were signed by his mother from yes, the Adelson Institute? Yes, ma'am, it was. Did you perform any job at the Adelson Institute? No, ma'am, I did not. You didn't go up there and clean on the weekends? No, ma'am, I did not. Now we're going to jump to the night of Dan's murder. As you've heard in previous trials, Katie's defense attorney argued that she never knew did not have anything to do with the money being transferred. But now we are finally hearing what's supposed to be the real story. And did you get payment for the murder that night? I believe it was the following morning. Were you in a panic when you arrived at his house? Was I in a panic? In a panic. I, I wasn't in a panic, but Charlie was. Okay, explain that. How was he acting? Uh, when I opened the door, he had he was kind of frantic, and he had a gun in his hand, and he was just all over the place. Was that normal behavior for him? N not having a gun in his hand, no, ma'am. All right. Did you know him to have a gun prior to that? Yes, ma'am. He has a gun safe. All right, but he just didn't usually carry around in his hand? Yeah, he's never had it in his hand. What was he saying to you when he was in this frantic state? I can't really recall because he he had given me some Xanax, so I it was a little blurry that night, and um, I I just tend to I just fell asleep. I think we both fell asleep. So, all right, can you tell the jury whether the excitement that he was showing had to do with the murder or something else? Yes, ma'am, it, it had to do with that. 
Okay. Um, was anybody else there at his residence when you arrived? At that day, no, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever see his parents at the residence? No, I didn't see his parents. Okay. How was the money packaged when you got it? I think you said you got it the next morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It How was, was it packaged? It was in um, it was in a plastic. The money was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag, that was inside a brown bag, and then like a grocery bag over it. And was the money stapled? Yes, ma'am, it was. Can you explain how it was stapled? Like what size bills and what increments were stapled together? Uh, I believe it was stapled in, I never counted it, but it was like in a stack and it was stapled in the corner. All right, were they $100 bills or something else? They were $100 bills and there was some 20s and 50s. Okay, and was the money damp? Yes, ma'am, it was. Explain what, what you mean to the jury. Um, a couple days after that, um, I went and I opened the bag and I called Sigfredo and I told him, I was like, there's mold on this money. And he's like, well, blow dry it. And I was like, but why would there be mold on the money? And he's just, I don't know, just blow dry it. So um, I believe his parents or his mom might have washed the, the money. You mean like physically wash the money? Yes, ma'am. And why do you think his mom did it? Because he oh he was always adamant about telling me he didn't have any money in his house. And he told me that his parents had just stopped by right before I got there. Okay. So all of a sudden he had money to put in my in the trunk of my car the was following the morning. Money, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Was the money already sorted out and packaged when you first saw it or was he doing that? No, it was there? already stacked and sorted out okay and did he have to so he didn't have to go anywhere to get the money he already had it when you arrived yes ma'am okay and i had to laugh at this because donna laundered the money like she actually washed it by hand i mean that's what it seemed like katie was insinuating right. and maybe donna thought there was going to be dna or fingerprints on it somehow but that is so weird mold on money like there was like mildew right. yuck but it's clear, this sounds like she's telling the truth. And of course, implicating Charlie's parents, specifically his mother, the defense is going to try to paint this as Katie extorting Charlie, and that she went over there and told him her secret, that her friend, who we know is the very Lewis, killed Dan, and now she needs money, and that she threatened Charlie to give it to her because her friend needs to see that Charlie's cooperating, or he will do the same thing he did to Dan to Charlie. But Georgia makes sure to ask Katie if there was ever a fight between them that night. I mean, she already said that he gave her Xanax and they both fell asleep and that this was never a plan that Sigfredo came up with on his own. But here's that interaction now. Was there any argument that night about the money or the next morning? With me and Charlie? Yes. No. Did you, I guess you did stay there that night. You may have already said that. Yes, I fell asleep. Was there any argument with, with the defendant at all about anything that night? No, ma'am. Not that I can recall. Did you threaten him in any way? No, ma'am. I did not. Did you, the night that you went to get the money, did you threaten Charlie Adelson in any way? No, ma'am. I did not. Did you try to extort money out of him? No, ma'am. I did not. The money that he gave you, is that something that had already been discussed or agreed upon in reference to this homicide? Well, I, I believe yes, because it was, it was going to be payment for this. You weren't, well, were you sent with a message from Sigfredo to tell him he better give it up or else? No, ma'am. Did you relay to the defendant that his family was in danger if he didn't give you whatever it was you were asking for. No, ma'am. How did Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera get paid for their part in this murder? Um, that morning, I, when I woke up, I was like, oh my God, I, I gotta go. So I, I drove back down and I was trying to look for Sigfredo and having a hard time that morning. 
And then eventually I made it to the alleyway of where Lewis's building was. Was that on Nor uh, North Miami? Yes. In like 135th. Where he lived with Jessica? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. And he just, I was just waiting in the car and all of a sudden Sefredo just like popped up and got inside the passenger seat. All right, so they got their money from you? Yes, ma'am. Sefredo did. And Rivera got paid as well, didn't he? I believe so, yes. At any time after, I know we talked about the night of the money, that you got the money, but at any time after that, did you ever blackmail Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you ever threaten him in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you relay any threats on behalf of Sigfredo Garcia? No, ma'am, I did not. Did anyone ever make you extort any money or other favors out of Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. Before the murder, had you bragged to Garcia and or Rivera about my new rich boyfriend? Um, I never, I didn't even know he had money like that. Well, I mean, he had a... I mean, he had a good job and, you know, he had a nice house, but I wasn't aware of how, you know, what, what, how much money he has. Okay. But he definitely had more than Sufredo Garcia. Oh, yes, ma'am. He did. <laughs> okay. And did you brag to Garcia like, oh, I got a new, better I mean, guy? I'm pretty sure he, he saw that I was happy and I was, you know, going out to dinners and hanging out with him, so... Okay, but did you tell them specifically he's got a lot of money? No, I did not. Did you tell them specifically he's got this issue with his uh, sister's ex-husband? I believe I mentioned it. Yes, okay. I did. And when you talked to them about he's got this issue with the sister's ex-husband, was that in the context of hiring them to do the murder? Or just in... And just, just in general. Okay, so just, they were aware that he had this issue. Well, Sigfredo was, yes. Okay, did you ever talk to Rivera about it? No, I did not. Okay, and when you talked to Sigfredo about it, did he ever say, well, I think I'll just drive to Tallahassee and kill the guy, or anything I mean, like that? No, ma'am, he did not. Is that something he would have mentioned to you if that was his idea? Sigfredo doesn't say a lot of things to me, so, and he likes to keep a lot of things away from me. So he okay. would have never asked me that or told me that. Okay. But in this case, I guess, okay. So is it possible that Sigfredo and Rivera came to Tallahassee and did this killing without any communication <laughs> from you or Charlie Adelson, just on their own? No, ma'am. And then that would extorted be. Charlie Adelson through you to get money because they had killed the guy. No, that'd be impossible. How would they have any information? Well, they could have seen it on the internet. No. When you were talking about Wendy's husband and the problems with him to Sigfredo Garcia, I know you've already said this, but I just want to be crystal clear. Yes, ma'am. Did you say the name Dan Markell? No, ma'am. I never knew Dan Markell's name. How was the name Dan Markell, the location and name of the target for this killing, provided to the killers? I believe it was all the information that was given to Sigfredo, which I got from Charlie, was all in that paper. Paper provided by this defendant? Yes, ma'am. In the, inside the envelope. Out of all the theories, this one seems like the truth to me because it just makes sense. I mean, if Charlie was really being extorted, why would he care if Dan was dead? They weren't even close. But I guess the defense is trying to say that Sigfredo was going to try to pin it on Charlie. But still, that does not make sense. And I think Charlie would have gone to the police, not just allowed this to go on and been nice to Katie. He has connections. His own sister's an attorney. His family has their ways that they could have alerted the authorities. Had this really been a true extortion? But now let's keep moving and get to the bump. We can't forget the bump. So two years later, everyone believed they had gotten away with Dan's murder until the bump happened. At that time, 
At the time of the bump, remember, by this time, Lewis was already in federal prison on unrelated charges, and Charlie had a theory on who was behind the bump. He believed it was either the FBI or Lewis Rivera's family, but he wasn't sure. So he had to do a lot of talking back and forth between his mom and then Katie, and apparently they used code words, which has been disputed, but Katie finally admits There were code words that Charlie came up with. And this is one of my favorite parts, especially when it comes to Katie admitting that the transcript that the state put together during the Dolce Vita recording was accurate, even though in the last trial, she pretended she couldn't understand it. I remember she's like, oh, I I, I don't know. That's what you're saying. She at that point was saying that the state was taking it out of context, but how the tables have turned. Here we go. Have you reviewed what I had marked for U.S. States Exhibit 111, the Dolce Vita recording with the transcript attached? Yes, ma'am, I did. And does the transcript in that exhibit accurately reflect the words that were said at that meeting between yourself and the defendant? Yes, ma'am. When the defendant described the bump to you, when you were speaking with Charlie Adelson and also Sigfredo Garcia about this bump. Did you speak in code? Yes, ma'am, I did. And what was the purpose of speaking in code? I kind of just piggybacked with what Charlie was speaking to me in code, so I kind of was like, okay, if he's talking in codes, kind of speaking codes as well. Was the concern that the calls could be recorded, being recorded? Um, my concern was more that I was at work, so... I really didn't want to say any phone numbers out loud or speak of what was going on. I'm going to approach and show you what I've marked as state's demonstrative A. Have you seen this before? I don't know if you have. No, ma'am, I have not. All right. And it's got several items listed here as code words with the actual meaning next to them. Yes, ma'am. Would you take a moment to just, and the ones in red are the ones used by you, the ones in yellow are used by Charlie Adelson. Okay. Will you review this exhibit and just tell me if it's accurate as far as what the code means? Yes, ma'am, it's it's accurate. Now she says, this paper that we're showing you on the screen if you're watching is accurate. And to break this down in an easy to understand way, The defense for Charlie called an objection at this point to a couple of these words that we can't see yet because they're only being shown to Katie. I think they only left the ones exchanged between Charlie and Katie during the calls and the Dolce Vita. There's a bunch of them, mostly related to the bump. For example, in reference to the undercover agent, Charlie would say patient, client, or even tenant because Katie worked at a real estate agency at the time. And he called that paperwork that was given to his mother, the listing, the paperwork. And this was just some of the code words. I was waiting for the word TV to be talked about, but as you can see, there are lines that are blacked out. And those are the words they were probably covering at this moment until later on. Now it was time for Katie to be cross-examined. The defense attorney wanted to highlight what a liar Katie had always been and how she was only telling this new story against Charlie because she had no other choice. And he did do a pretty decent job. He was pretty convincing. We're going to edit this clip a little bit so that it's a little quicker than it would take to get through all of the lies. The real reason you didn't cooperate and you made it clear is because Charlie Adelson had absolutely nothing to do with the murder of Professor Markell. Isn't that the case? I didn't cooperate because in order to give a, give up Charlie, I'd have to give up Sigfredo. Well, let's talk about the testimony in your first trial. And don't worry, we're going to get to your proffers as well. Okay. But let's talk about the testimony in your first trial. You were asked, did you get the father of your children, Mr. Garcia, to commit a murder on behalf of Mr. Charlie Adelson? Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. You were asked... Can you, do you have information that Charlie Adelson was involved in this? Answer, do I have information? I don't have personal information. Do you recall that? No, sir, I do not. You don't recall saying that in your first trial? No, sir, I do not. Would you like to see a transcript of it? Yes, I will. Does that refresh your recollection that that's what you said? Yes, sir, it does. During your second trial, do you recall being asked, 
Charlie didn't ask you to do anything weird? Answer, no, ma'am. Like get someone to get a hitman to commit a murder of his ex-brother-in-law? No, ma'am. Do you recall those questions and that answer? Yes, sir, I do. Because you couldn't implicate Charlie, you went to trial, and the first trial hung. Isn't that the case? Yes, sir. A few weeks before your second trial, Charlie was arrested. Yes, Isn't sir. that the case? Yes, sir. The state waited and waited and waited for you to cooperate, and then they arrested him on the eve of your trial when you made it clear you weren't going to cooperate, right? Yes, sir. So you went to trial the second time, and this time you were convicted. Yes, sir. And you were convicted of first-degree murder and other charges, right? Yes, sir. A few weeks after your conviction, you were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus another 30 years. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you were transferred from the jail in Leon County to the state prison where you would spend the rest of your life, right? Yes, sir. Away from your family? Yes, sir. Away from your children? Yes, sir. And you realize that there are only two ways to get out of that prison, right? What are the two ways? Well, one way was in a coffin, right? Yes, sir. And the other way was cooperating against Charlie Adelson, right? No, sir. I wanted the truth to finally come out. What are the only two ways that you can ever get out of prison, Miss Magbanawa? My appeal. Oh, well, we'll get to that, too. You have an appeal pending right now, right? Yes, sir. That claims that you're innocent. Yes, sir. But let's just make this clear to the jury. Miss Kappelman has called you as a witness against this man who's presumed innocent. You've just testified that you did a murder and you have an appeal pending right now in this county claiming your innocence. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. All right, that's enough. It's clear that she lied and a pretty significant gotcha moment by the defense. All it proved was that Katie was the type of person who would lie for her own personal benefit. The prosecution had already established that in the first few minutes of her testimony. And you heard the defense refer to Katie's plan to get Sigfredo to lie on her behalf. She would call Sigfredo's mom from prison and have her put Sigfredo on speaker from another phone so they could talk. By law, Katie was prohibited from speaking with or contacting her co-conspirators. Sigfredo never testified, and there is a theory on why that is. It involves him protecting his mother from prosecution for facilitating communication between two convicted felons. But that's just theory. There are no direct evidence or explanation for why Sigfredo chose not to testify on Katie's behalf. This looks bad for Katie and the prosecution. But before Georgia gets her chance to press him for answers, Charlie's attorney gets to lay out his theory. And there had already been two other trials, and the defense had a preview of the prosecution's case. They were ready to address every single piece of evidence against Charlie with a carefully crafted story. And this is one of the most riveting testimonies that I've ever heard, or at least in a while, from a defendant. We can't play it in its entirety because I think it would take at least a day or two in order to get through the whole thing. But of course, we will highlight the best parts first. Charlie didn't look too nervous when it was his turn to take the stand. He came off as confident, maybe too confident, but he gets to tell his story. One that I can guarantee they have practiced a number of times, possibly in front of a mock jury, to see how well it was received. I'm sure his attorney was confident that Charlie would come off as likable, believable, and trustworthy, or he wouldn't have wanted him to testify. Charlie said he didn't have any part in Dan's murder, that he didn't pay anyone to kill him, and he didn't even put that envelope into Katie's diaper bag like she insisted he did. His attorney addressed Donna's emails, and he does a really good job making light of them. He even admits to the idea of a bribe and that he was going to pitch in, and of course that he told others, including Katie, which is where the defense is trying to plant this seed, that this is how Katie got the idea to extort him. Now, we've seen some emails regarding converting the boys to Christianity. We've seen some pretty out there emails from your mom. Do you recall seeing those emails in this trial? I do. And do you recall whether you saw those emails when they were written back when they were written? Yeah, I, I would get forwarded me all kinds of stuff, for sure. Did you come up with any of those ideas? No. On some of those emails... We'll see that you respond, I like it. Why did you respond that way? Well, my, my sister tried being really nice to Danny. It got her nowhere, and he was being really litigious, and he was looking to give her a hard time. And I thought that this would, I thought it was a way that she would go ahead and give him a hard time back and 
kind of push his buttons the way he was trying to push her buttons. So basically, you know, if he's being a jerk to you, just be a jerk back and see if maybe he'll stop. So I, I didn't think any of those things she was actually ever going to follow through with, you know, but I, I thought that it would really push his button. So I, I thought, why not give it a shot? I want to talk about the million dollar offer. Did you ever become aware of efforts by your family, including yourself, yes. to offer Professor Markell money to allow your sister to relocate? I did, yes. And do you recall who came up with that idea? It was my parents. What was the, what were the terms of the offer? How much was it for? The offer was uh, for $1 million to, to have him move down south to South Florida with my sister and the boys, and that would afford him enough money that he could easily commute to his job in Tallahassee for the days that he worked, uh, just the way senators in South Florida commute to Tallahassee all the time, and that was the idea behind it. Now, how were you involved in this idea? Not super involved, but I, I definitely said to my parents, I said, I will, I will help and I will pay a third of that million dollars and when Wendy one day starts making real money um, you know she's able to I want to be paid back at this point in time were you making more money than your parents I was yes did you or your family ever speak with an attorney about the legality of this I didn't but I know they they wanted to run it by uh, an attorney I think they used Gary Cohn to uh, to run it by do you know if the offer was ever made? I, as I sit here today, I know that the offer was never made. But back when the offer I thought was made, I thought it was made and I thought it was turned down. Did you, Charlie, you like to talk a lot, right? Yeah, I, I didn't realize how much I talk until I listened to all those tapes. And uh, evidently I do. I mean, I, I knew I liked to talk, but didn't realize how much. When you got involved in this million dollar offer, would you talk about it with others? Yes. How would it come up? It would come up when people would say, you know, doesn't your sister want to move back back home? You know, how's she doing? And I said, yeah, no, she definitely wants to move back home. We tried everything we could. Like, we even offered a million dollars to uh, to Dan to see if he would move down with her. And, uh, and it didn't work. Like, he, he turned it down. Did you ever talk with... Catherine Magbanawa, and we'll talk a lot about her in a little bit, but did you ever talk with Catherine Magbanawa about that million dollar offer? Yes, I did. And what do you remember telling her? The same thing I told everybody else is it came up when my she was asking me about, you know, doesn't your sister want to move back home? And I said, yeah, I said, you know, we tried everything we could. We even offered Danny a, a million dollars to move back to South Florida. And uh, and it didn't work. It's the same thing I said to her is what I said to a bunch of people. How did she respond? She she was like, "Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of money." She's like, "You, you got to take out a loan for that." And I said, "No, I I got cash. I can pay for it." I have to say, he does a great job on the stand. He's likable. He's calm. He makes sense. But remember, his attorney is questioning him. And they've most likely, like I said, practiced this time and time again to prepare him. But just wait until it's George's turn. But right now, his attorney is about to try to explain away the TV. And I cannot wait. So let's play it. Now let's talk about um, gifts to your sister during her divorce. In general, did you provide any financial assistance to Wendy during the divorce? No. She, she never asked, and I, I never gave her any money. Did you pay for her lawyers? Never. Now, did you give her any gifts? And, and let's just start with the broad question, and then we'll break it down. Did yes. Did you give her any gifts? Yes, I, I've given her gifts during the course. Okay. Do you recall giving her a TV? Yes. How did that come about? Well, when she was moving out of the marital home... Um, and she was starting, you know, from scratch in a new house. She didn't take any of the, it only took her belongings. Um, I said to my mom, I said, what does Wendy need? Like, what does she need for the new place? And she said, actually, she's, she's uh, leaving the TV sets. She needs a TV set for the, for the house. 
So I said, all right, fine. I said, go to, you know, go to the store up there and go to Best Buy and pick out a really nice TV set, and I'll, I'll pay for it. I said, buy it, and I'll give you the money. Now, do you recall making a joke that buying her a TV was cheaper than hiring a hitman? Something to that effect. Yeah, it was. Want me to say what? Uh, yeah, tell me what the joke what was. I, what happened was, I, when I gave her the TV set as a divorce present, I was stupid, the stupidest thing I ever said in my life. And I said, uh, you know, I, I was going to get you a hitman, but the the, che- the TV set was a lot cheaper, so I went with the TV set instead. And I, I said it as a complete joke, and it was stupid, but I do that a lot. Did you make that joke to others? Yes. Did you make that joke many times throughout 2013 and 2014? I made, I made that joke when she was having problems and she was fighting and she was upset. I, I recycled the joke and it was stupid. Did you ever say that joke to Catherine Magbanoa? Yes, I did. Just, just to be clear, did you ever look into hiring a hitman? No, never. Did you see that deep breath at the end? Yeah, he had to let that all out. Yes. It's just like, because that was a really hard question to answer. And it's out of the way now. So I think that was a sigh of relief and it must have felt really good for him. But now let's hear about Katie and why he was attracted to her. Initially, did you learn anything about her ex-husband? No. I, the only thing I knew is that she'd been with somebody for about 10 years uh, and that she was now single. After you dated her a couple times, what did you like about her? Well, and aside from the initial things, what attracted me to her was she was she had a very busy life also. And my life was so busy it was hard for me to be in a room. A relationship where someone wanted to go have dinner at five five o'clock and sit, hang out with me a couple of days a week. So she was she was working full time, had two kids, so she was fine seeing me once or twice a week, and we, we both had very little time. Now you said that your first date was sometime in early October, two thousand thirteen. Yeah, it wasn't even a real date. We just went and had dinner. There's a restaurant in the building, and we finished late, and I said, you want to grab dinner? We ate at the, at the building. Did you ask her just two weeks later if she could find someone to kill Professor Markell? No, not at all. Did you have a Halloween party with her or go trick-or-treating with her, and after the party say, hey, uh, do you know anyone who can take care of my ex-brother-in-law for me? No, absolutely not. Now, back to the relationship. Over time, did it become more serious? Over time, you know, in the beginning, it's always like you're just trying to see who each other is. And then as time went on, she wanted to get more serious. I'd say probably by the springtime, by probably around March. She started asking me. Now, did you consider her to be your girlfriend, though? She was my girlfriend, yeah. Uh, did you consider yourself to be exclusive? After the first three months together, yeah, for sure. Did you ever see a possibility of marriage with her? No, I didn't. During the time that you dated her, how often, and let's, let's, let's be clear, we're talking about now the beginning of 2014. Right. So let's keep it far away from July. During the time that you dated her, how often would you communicate with her? We, we talked every day. When would you talk to her? I'd call her when I was in the car driving to, to work. Um, we'd text throughout the day, and, uh, and then I'd always talk to her at night time. Did she go to family events with you? Um, she did meet my family a couple times, yeah. She met your sister how many times, if you recall? Two times. And how many times do you think she might have met your parents? I would say probably maybe 
maybe around eight times, okay. eight or nine times. Was she a patient of your dad's? Yes, she was. We're going to get into this in more detail later, but let's be clear right now. Did Catherine Magbanua ever work for your dad or for you at the Adelson Institute? No, never. Now, I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but as time went on in 2014, did she want to be more serious? Yeah. And what did you think about that? I, I liked the, the way it was. I mean, it was it was good in the beginning. My life, I wasn't looking to change it. I was still in that workaholic mode. Um, but she started asking me, you know, what are we? What are we doing? Sounds like he wanted a booty call. Yeah, exactly. He wanted someone available on his time, not someone that he had to go on real dates with. He wanted someone that was okay just coming over late night and just chill. Nothing wrong with that. But we all know that Katie was hoping for more. And even Charlie said that. He did. And he never considered her as someone he wanted to marry. Of course not. And he said he didn't ask her if she knew anyone that could hurt someone just two weeks after they met. But if he saw her as someone to facilitate what he wanted, and he wanted someone to kill Dan, don't you think that's possible? I feel Charlie is quite the opportunist. Yes, he is. And there were some texts between Katie and Charlie where Katie apparently wanted more from him in January, February, and March of 2014 before the murders. And how Charlie didn't want to rush into things. But she even got excited when he told her that he mentioned her to his mother. So let's hear about that. Do you recognize these text messages? Yes, I do. Were they kept... Are they accurate reflections of your text messages? They are, yes. In this exchange, what is Miss Magbanawa asking you about? She asked me she asked me if I wanted things to be different and she was saying how much she missed me. And did you want things to be different at this point in time? No, I, I wanted things to stay the way they were from when we just started dating. Now, if you turn to Defense Exhibit 36, text messages from February 5th, 2014, mm -hmm. what is she asking you? What does she start by asking you about? And you don't have to read it. Just tell the jury generally what she's asking you about. What is she concerned about? She's asking if I'm talking to a bunch of other girls. And what do you tell her in response generally? I, I say, no, I'm not. And again... In this text message, she's asking you whether, she's telling you that she wants more, right? Yeah. And how do you respond? I ask her, are you thinking about getting back with your ex? And then what do you say after that? Oh, uh, yeah. I say, you're the coolest and most fun girl that I'm always happy when I'm around. And then I said, I know it's, it's not easy, and I think we're doing a good job at not rushing things. So. And what were you trying to tell Miss Magbanua in this text message? I was trying to say I, I like you and I have a good time hanging out with you, but I don't want to rush things. Now, moving to text messages in March of 2014, Miss Magbanua texts you, you've mentioned me to your mom, and you say yes, and she says, I love you. Aw, baby. How did you, why was this a big deal to her? Um... I guess when I'd spoken to her, I brought up that I'd mentioned her to my mom, and she thought I was trying to, I was making things more serious. So she, she got, I think she got excited over that. Aw, poor Katie. She had the wrong idea, but it's true. She wanted more. Would that have led her to trying to extort Charlie, though? Or would it make more sense that she would want to come through and get rid of Dan to impress Donna, to get in her good graces and stay close to Charlie? That makes more sense to me. But it does make you think. And his defense attorney made sure to address Charlie's father's big birthday gift. Was it killing Dan Markell? Let's see. Do you recall the state showing text messages where you're texting with your mom and she tells you that she can't talk right now, that she'll call you when she's alone. She's driving back and she's at a stop in, in Gainesville. And to erase the text message? Yeah. Do you recall what that is all about? It was about my dad's birthday. 
Who so. was your mom with at that stop at Gainesville? She was with my dad, so she didn't want to talk in front of him. And why didn't she want to talk in front of him? Because it was a surprise. We, originally, we were thinking about doing a cruise. What was a surprise? That you were going to kill Professor Markell, or that you were going to have a surprise birthday party for your dad? No, it was, it was going to be his 70th birthday party. And do you recall in that text message talking about a caterer? Yes. You had discussed this caterer as far back as April and May with your mom, correct? Yes. And those are reflected in text messages as well, correct? Yes, they are. On June 5th, do you recall your mom texting you and asking you don't forget to get information on the caterer? Yes. Now, what did you get your dad for his birthday gift? I paid for the catering for the party. And what type of catering was it? It was uh, a chef came to the party and they cooked paella and seafood and, uh, and then we had a bunch of desserts also and salads. I mean, it seems reasonable, but we're getting closer to when Dan was murdered, which was on Friday, July 18th. His attorney asked him about speaking with his sister, Wendy. A couple of nights before Dan was killed, Charlie and Katie got into an argument because he went out to dinner with a co-worker until about midnight. That was Erica, who took the stand earlier, and she loved working with Charlie. Katie was questioning why he wasn't answering her calls. She accused him of cheating. And then when they attempted to make up, Katie wanted Charlie to go out to dinner with her on Friday. Still, Charlie tried to explain that he worked late and he had to drive far and really didn't want to go out. And that would end up being the night of Dan's murder. Exactly. And Charlie ended up telling Katie she was acting like a bitch. Hence, the following day, Charlie called Wendy to tell her about the fight and to get some advice. He also explained some of the concise calls we talked about in the last video, some text exchanges, and then the missed calls from his mother who said to call us ASAP. Now we're on the 18th, July 18th. <laughs> did you uh, speak with your sister that morning? I did. What do you recall talking to your sister about? I called her in the car on the way up to work. Um, and I ended up talking to her. She's told me that she was having the TV set repaired. I thought she had told me that Lincoln had thrown something at it and, bro and broke the screen. Um, so she was getting a TV fix. And then I, I was also, the reason I called her was because I was in a fight with Katie and I wanted to get her opinion on something. So I spoke to her and told her what I said to Katie and she gave me sisterly advice like, like she usually does. And Again, that morning, you're in the car for quite some time? An hour, about an hour and a half. Uh, where were the two, you were working at one or two offices that day? I was working in two offices, but they're across the street from each other in Jupiter. Okay. And um, during the call up to Jupiter, did you make several phone calls? Yeah, that's my morning routine, and I was in the car for an hour and a half, so I was on the phone a bunch. Now, there's several times where there is a phone call made and then immediately after there's another call and there, there's short calls and then immediately after there's another call. Do you know why that was the case? Yeah, because there's a stretch of highway between West Palm and up in Jupiter where you'll get drop calls constantly. So you'll call somebody and then call, you can't hear the person or it doesn't go through and they start talking and you hang up and call them again. So it's... The calls drop constantly up there. Okay. Do you recall having some text message communication with um, a friend named Mike and also Catherine McBanawa about dinner that night? Yes, I do. And without getting into too many specifics, what was the general issue? Mike had wanted me to get dinner with him um, because his house is kind of closer to kind of close to Jupiter and sometimes when I'm up that way I'll see him um, Katie was still upset about the other day and feeling like I'm, I give more time to other people and questioning why it's a Friday night and I don't want to spend it with her um, I eventually just texted with Katie and I apologized for calling her a bitch and telling her I, I didn't I said she was acting like one I didn't call her one but evidently to some people there's no difference and I, I shouldn't have said it so I I ended up apologizing and making dinner plans with her. So you chose to make dinner plans uh, with Katie that night, correct? Yeah. 
And uh, where are the dinner plans were going to actually happen? Um, did you did you get that far in making specific plans? No, but I, I said I just want to do something casual in Fort Lauderdale. I don't want to get all dressed up and head to Miami. Okay. Now, um, the second office, you're working in for a little period of time, right? That evening. You, 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 what? In other words, let me let me rephrase. Yeah. Uh, you had a bunch of surgeries in that second office, right? Yeah, they're usually packed. And do you recall from a text message that around a little after six, you were about to start a big procedure? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, at some point in time, you hear from your mom. How do you hear from your mom? Um, I had a missed call from her, one or two missed calls, and then she texted me, call us ASAP. And why did you miss? Uh, why did you miss the calls? What were you doing? I was in surgery. Okay. I think we all know what Donna needed to talk to Charlie about. This was the night that Wendy is sitting in that interview room with Detective Isom and made that call to her mom and tells her to relay what's going on to Charlie for her and how all of this made him feel and what he planned to do that night. I've been waiting for this moment, so let's hear it. After she texted you, call call her ASAP, what did you do? Um, I stopped what I was doing. I could see the text messages on the phone as they come in, so I, I knew it was important. I stopped what I was doing, and I called her right back. When you called her back, what did she tell you? She, she told me that Wendy had just called her and that Dan had been shot and that it was serious and that her and my dad are going to be going up to Tallahassee to be with her. How did you react? I was I was shocked. I I said, "Is is he is he okay? Is is he going to be okay? Are the are the boys okay? Or Wendy's okay? Like what what happened?" And what did your mom tell you? She said she didn't know any details. That it was really serious, and uh, and that Wendy's with the police right now, and they're questioning her. Now. After you got off the phone with your mom, what did you do? I went I went back to work. Okay. And uh, did you have some communications with people after that through text messages about how you were feeling? I did. And generally speaking, how were you feeling? I wasn't feeling great. I, mean, I was pretty upset about what I just heard. Okay. Now. Around what time, if you remember, did you leave the office? Probably about between 8.20 and 8.30. Okay. And again, it's a pretty far drive, correct? Yeah. Even at that time of night? Yeah, there's no, there's no traffic at that time, so I can, I can speed a little bit. But. On your car ride home, did you make phone calls? Yes, I did. And in particular, and we'll do it one at a time, um, did you speak with Catherine Magbanawa? Yes, I did. And what did you tell Catherine Magbanawa on your ride home? I I told her that uh, my brother-in-law, my ex-brother-in-law, had been shot, and uh, and it's serious. And uh, I just told her I really didn't feel like going out tonight, and just hang out at the house if you still want to come over. She said, No, I definitely. I mean, I'm still coming to see you. How did she seem? Seemed normal. I mean, she seemed concerned, but not, nothing out of the ordinary. Now, are you aware that after that phone call, Catherine Magbanawa had to frantically go around and try to get a babysitter for her kids? No, not at all. Now, did you speak with your mom on the way home to your house? Yeah, like I called my parents also in, from the car. And... What did you find out from your parents? That they were they were getting ready to uh, to leave, and that they were heading up to uh, they were going to head up to Tallahassee, and that they were going to probably stop up in Orlando because it's late, and they wouldn't get up there till. So they're going to spend the night in Orlando and then go up to uh, Tallahassee. Now you've seen text messages in this case where. Uh, there's some indication 
your mom says outside your house and 20 minutes later after that text message you say 10 minutes do you recall those text messages yes i do okay did you see your parents that evening no not at all okay when your mom says outside your house does that mean she to you that she was actually at your house no it, it meant that she was passing by my house outside it on the vicinity seeing if i was home on the phone call that you had with your mom on the way home, did you discuss anything about her stopping, her, your parents stopping at your house? Yeah, I said, text me when you're close. If I'm home, stop by and see me because my house is a football field length away from the exit of the turnpike. And when they were close, were you anywhere near your house? No, and I, I missed their text. I didn't get home for... 40 minutes after that text came through. When you got home, what did you do? Um, when I got home, I changed, took a shower. I took a shower, changed, and uh, I played phone tag with Katie to see where she was at. Um, I think I talked to her after I got out of the shower. And she was, um, and she was going to be heading over to hang out with me. You have a text with your friend Mike that said you went to the gym. Do you have a gym? Did you go to the gym? No. Okay. Do you know if you worked out in your house that night? I don't know. If I, I've got some. I've got some workout equipment in a house, so I, I may very well have. But I, I didn't go to the gym that night. This is interesting. We showed you these texts where his mother was texting him that she was outside of his house. Presumably, this was when she dropped off the soggy money, because as Katie said, Charlie usually didn't have that much money with him, and it was wet. And since we know that Donna and Harvey ended up in Tallahassee after this, this would have been the only time that money could have been dropped off, knowing that the hit had just been completed. It's interesting, though, that Charlie denied it. Really? Why would he text her back with his ETA if he never intended to see her that night? And the whole gym thing he dispelled, it was a rumor that Dan was killed and then he went off to work at the gym because that was like really insensitive, I guess. But what about what happened that night? The defense says Katie admits that a friend of hers had Dan killed. But the prosecution, including Katie, said no. This was already planned. Charlie knew, and this was to get money for the hit. But let's hear Charlie's version of the story. You said you called Katie after your shower. Why did you call her? To see if she was still planning on coming over and uh, at what time she was going to be there because it was like it was already like 10, 10, 15. And did she come to your house that night? Yeah, she said she was going to be leaving shortly. And I think I even said, either text me or call me when you're on your way. Did she actually come to your house that evening? Yes, she did. Okay. Around what time did she arrive? She got there about 11 o'clock. What happened when she arrived? When she arrived to my house, she came in through the garage, entered into the kitchen from the side door like she always does. And she just looked panicked and upset. I mean, she walks straight in and gives me this big, tight hug and asks me, like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, just a horrible day. But she looked more upset than I, I mean, I've ever seen her. And I'm like, are you okay? So she's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, just come sit down. I need to talk to you. Where did you go? We walked into the living room. And what happened when you got to the living room? We sat down on the couch and she started to talk to me and she said listen this is all my fault but i had no idea anything was going to happen but this is totally my fault i spoke in too much detail about your family's personal problems about your sister dan markell and the million dollar offer what did you say i'm like what are you talking about and she's like she's like my friend killed dan and he wants to be paid a third of a million dollars how did you react? I was like, what did you just say? And she's like, my friend killed Dan and he wants you to pay a third of a million dollars. 
What happened next? I stood up and I, I started cursing it. I'm like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? And she's like, no. I'm like, who, who did this? Who's your friend that did this? And she's like, I don't want to say. I can't say. And I, I said, who, who was it? And she just kept saying, I'm not going to tell you. And I was like, is it, was it Sigfredo? And, uh, and she's like, no, I'm not, I'm not telling you. And I just walked in my bedroom and sat down on the edge of my bed. What happened when you got in the bedroom? She, um, she came into the bedroom, followed after me. She sat down next to me. She started telling me, like, I'm so sorry. This is, this is all my fault, but I didn't know any of this was going to happen. And I'm like, Katie, I'm, I'm not going to be part of this shit. Like, I'm not going to be part of paying for a murder. This is insane. And, she, and she's like, look, if you don't pay in 48 hours, they will kill you. And I said, Katie, I, I feel like I'm, I'm getting extorted now. How did she respond to that? She, she got really mad at me. She, she got angry. And she's like, look, I'm not extorting you. She's like, I got dragged into this the same way you got dragged into this. She's like, it's my fault for running my mouth the way I did. But I'm not extorting you. Like, I'm trying to help you. So she's like, you got to, she goes, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to the police? She goes, you go to the police, they'll kill you. Did she tell you that they would just kill you or they would also kill other people? She said he'd come after you, he'd come after the family. Like, Charlie, you, you don't have a choice. Just, just pay the money. You said you had the, you said you had the cash. You said you were going to pay a third. Like, just, just do it. Like, I'm trying to help you out. What did you do then? I said, Katie, I, I don't have a third of a million in cash. And she's like, you said you did. And I was like, no, I, I cash isn't I can write a check for a third of a million. I don't need to take out a loan. And she's like, well, you have a ton of money in your safe. And I, I say, Katie, I, I, don't have a, I don't have that much in my safe. I do have a lot. And I said, come, take a look. And I walked over to my safe. I opened it up. And I'm like, here, take a look. And I took it out in piles and put it on the dresser next to us. And I said, I said go ahead and count. I go, that's, that's not a third of a million. And did she count it? Yes, she did. How much money did she count? Uh, 138000 So it wasn't 100000 It was 138000 Correct. What did she do with the hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars? She put it in her she had a big purse. She put it in her purse and she asked me, she goes, When how can you get the rest? And I'm like, Hey, that's all the cash I've saved up from forever. And she said, Can you go to your parents and get it? And I was like, If I go to my parents, my dad will go to the cops in a second. Like there's no way I'm gonna be able to stop my dad from going to the police. Like I could never say anything to him. What happened next? She asked me, she said, well, can you pay like, can you pay like $3,000 a month? And, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I, can, I can do that. Now at this point in time, did you have any idea that she was part of the extortion? No, no. She kept saying it was all her fault and that she didn't know any of this was going to happen. And I, she, I mean, she was upset. What did she do next? She took her purse, her keys and her phone, and she's like, I'm going to go call my friend and see if, see if this works for him, and I'm going to try to help you out. And she walked out of the house, and my bedroom was right next to the front door. She walked out of my bedroom out, outside of the front door and uh, closed the door behind her. When she went out of the house, what did you do? I just paced around my house, and I remember sitting in the living room, I got a wood coffee table and I was just sitting on the coffee table just in shock thinking, what the fuck just happened? What happened when she came back in the house? She, she came in the house and she was being the good guy and telling me that she's going to look out after me and she's so sorry this happened. It's the same thing she was saying beforehand and that she was going to make sure that nobody pays me a visit and she's like, I spoke to him. You, you can pay 3000 a month or you can pay the rest off. She goes, but the 3000 a month you're paying doesn't go towards the balance. What did you do after she told you that? I just, I just said, fine. And I, I walked downstairs into the kitchen and I, I, I was shaking and I, and I took a bar of Xanax. Where did you go? And I, I walked outside from the kitchen through the sliders into the backyard. I closed the sliding glass door behind me. I think she got the picture I wanted to be alone. And I, I just sat outside 
behind my house for a while. Now, when you came back into the house, what was she like? She was just apologizing and just telling me that her friend's crazy and she's so sorry and she she ran her mouth too much about about everything and about the million dollar offer and uh, she was telling me that she was going to protect me. Did she take a Xanax as well? I don't I don't know if she did. She may have, but I didn't give her one. Did she spend the night that night? She did sleep over that night. Now, why didn't you kick her out? I was in, I was in the state of shock, and I I didn't think she had anything to do with it. I didn't even want to believe that she had anything to do with it. When you came back in the house, what happened to you next? Um, I was the Xanax was really starting to set in. It's probably about a half hour I was outside. Um, I remember going into the bedroom and sitting down. I, uh, I sent the text to my parents to see if they were up in Orlando yet or where they were. And then I just, I laid down in bed and I, I passed out pretty soon after that. So do you believe him? No, I don't believe him. His body language is all off to me and it's super scripted. And it's so obvious that this is a made up story. It doesn't even sound right to me. It doesn't sound, it doesn't make any sense. You'd really take a Xanax after some chick is about to steal your cash and her psycho friend killed someone? There's no way. There's no way you'd be able to go to bed after that. No way. But let's finish this out with what's next before we really close out with George's cross-examination. What happened the next morning, Charlie? The next morning, when did she leave? She left about 8.30 in the morning. And how was she in the morning? How was she acting? She was apologizing and telling me how sorry she is, and she was blaming herself and saying it's all my fault for running my mouth and telling my friend about this. And she was just telling me that she was going to protect me and that I wasn't going to get a visit from anybody. What did she, did she tell you anything in particular before she left the house? Yeah, she told me, whatever you do, she said, please don't tell anybody about what happened. Like, don't, don't tell anybody about this. I don't never talk about this, never talk about it on the phone. She said, never call me up and start talking about this. And she, the last thing she said to me is like, can we, can we just pretend like this never even happened? She leaves the house, and we're going to get into specifics, but that day, July 19th, where do you go? I don't leave the house. I was, I was home all day. What were you thinking and what were you doing when you were home on the 19th? I was, I was sleeping a bunch. I think I took probably some more Xanax trying to relax and I was, I was just real upset that morning uh, did you speak with your parents and with Wendy Adelson I did I, I talked to my parents that morning and what did you find out I found out that Dan had died and why did you call Wendy Adelson because I that was the first call I called after my parents told me that to see how she was see how the boys were now, you're home alone the entire day of the 19th. Did you think about going to the police? I thought about it, but I, I thought I'm, I'm going to get killed if I go to the police. It's not going to bring Dan back. It just seemed like a bad idea. Over the days following, did you continue to go back and forth about whether to go to the police or not? Every time I thought about it, I thought through what could happen to me, what, what would be the benefit versus the pros versus the cons. And why didn't you go to the police? I thought if I went to the police that they'd kill me. So he doesn't go to the police because he thinks they're going to kill him. And then he proceeds to pay Katie for the next few months by her presence and even put her on the payroll. Even though they're not together anymore. There's no reasonable person who believes that. No, there isn't. I mean, a reasonable jury isn't going to believe that. I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. Well, let's let Georgia get to him because this is one of the best cross-examinations since Jody Arias and Juan Martinez. If you know, you know. Here's Georgia's cross-examination now, and I love how she opened this up. It's exactly what I was saying earlier. Have you ever heard the saying that the simplest explanation is always the most likely? Have you heard I've, that? I've heard that theory before, yeah. 
was your explanation to the jury over the last little over a day the simplest explanation? It was the truth. Do you, I mean, you have a thorough explanation. Would you agree with that? I told you what happened. Do you agree that the only problem with having an explanation for everything is that there's just so many explanations? There's no explanation. I explained what happened. I want to go through some of that. You claim that you were extorted on July 18th, 2014 by Catherine Magbanoa and also in the background, some Latin Kings, probably Garcia and Rivera, right? Is that accurate? No, I wasn't extorted by Catherine Magbanoa. You weren't? Not, okay, not, who, that's not what I believed in 2014. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I understood you to say you believe that today. Today I do, yes. All right, so who extorted you? I believe that it was Catherine Magbanoa's friend that she ran her mouth to. Okay. And, and that's at the, at 2014. The, Right, but as you sit here today, you think it's Magbanoa, Garcia, and Rivera. Is that mm. accurate? No, that's not accurate. Okay. Who extorted you? As I sit here today, I believe that it was Catherine Magbanoa, and I believe Sigfredo Garcia, but I don't know for sure. Georgia went on to challenge Charlie's new version of events. She pushed Charlie to have an answer for every piece of evidence, including the fact that Lewis testified to being paid with stapled money. And several people close to Charlie testified that he was known to staple cash in $1,000 increments. She thought his explanations were a little too convenient. Yeah, and the money thing was telling, but he has another excuse, another explanation, a convenient one, that of course the money came from him. Katie was extorting him, duh. And the money, the $138,000, was that stapled into $1,000 increments? Each packet was $1,000 and they were, had a staple in it. And stapling money's a little unusual. Would you agree with that? It's, for me, it wasn't unusual. That's what I did. Right, but nobody else does it. That's why I'm suggesting it's unusual. I've, I've never questioned people into how they keep their money, whether they keep it in a staple or a paper clip or an envelope. I just know what I do. Would you agree, doctor, that it's a compelling piece of evidence that the killers were paid in stapled money and came up with that information in this case? It's, it's not compelling. The, the people who extorted me and got my money got it from my house and it was stapled at my house. They had to have gotten it from you, right? Because it was stapled. If they got it from Katie, they got it from me. So it had to be some kind of, I paid, but I did it under duress, based on that piece of evidence, right? That had to be built into your defense. I was extorted and I paid the money. Yeah, that is way too convoluted. And this next part really begins the dismantling of his defense. When she mentioned this layaway plan, who does that? No, it's usually, this is how much it is to have someone killed. And then it's paid, but it's obvious he was keeping Katie quiet. I'm not sure why, but we can only assume so she didn't turn on him as time went on and the money would run out. He tried to explain away his behavior in conversations after the bump by believing it was a second extortion attempt. Then Georgia turned the conversation to Wendy and thought it was strange that if the hitman were in Miami, that Charlie would want his sister and her young boys, whose father had just been murdered by these same people, to come live closer to where the hitmen were. And I thought that was a great argument. Tell me what you think of this. I want to go back to Wendy. Wendy is in the process of relocating from Tallahassee to South Florida, basically the day that this is going on, day after the money drop, right? They're, they're packing up the car. They're coming back. Yeah. Right. So she's going to be moving significantly closer to the killers that had threatened her life. This, this, what I don't, I don't, she wasn't planning a, it wasn't a permanent move or anything that was planned. I think she took a suitcase with her. But she's your family member, yes. She's much closer to the one they've already killed than you, right? She's, say it again. She's much closer. She's got much deeper connections to the person they've already killed. That's Dan Markell than you do. Right. I mean, there's a reason to fear for her safety because these killers have come, they've just killed Dan, and now they're saying they're going to kill another one. It could be Wendy, right? She, she has no idea what's going on. Exactly. But you let her move from Tallahassee to Miami where you knew the killers were located. That's my point. 
Do you agree with that? The, the killers were able to find Dan Markell in Tallahassee. They have a car. They were. But would you rather live in Tallahassee or in Miami if the killers are in Miami? I think if these people want to find you, they'll find you. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, looking at Luis Rivera, I don't think a, I don't think a distance would stop him. Georgia asked him repeatedly if he resented Wendy for not being more appreciative of everything that he had done for her, as he mentioned in the text messages with his mom. She repeatedly pointed out why his arguments held no logic and that Wendy had to have known. She even went to the crime scene and this is too good not to play. Do you and Donna have to protect Wendy? No. Does Wendy appreciate everything you and Donna do for her? You got you got to ask her. I mean, she's my sister. I love her. I try to give her my best advice I can and if I I care about her and I give her my advice whether she takes it or not is uh is up to her. She's me, a, she's a grown woman. Let me ask it another way. Do you feel or isn't it true that you don't feel that Wendy appreciates everything you and Donna do for her? And my sister had no idea what I've been through in the last, God knows how many years. And what I, I wake up worrying, am I going to get killed? Am I going to get arrested? And she knows none of it. She's just going around her life. And I had an, somewhat of an innate anger towards her, mm-hmm. you know, probably unjust because she didn't know what happened. But yeah, I, I was upset. And weren't you saying on the wire that you that she doesn't appreciate what you and Donna have done for her? She, I, I don't know if I said that she doesn't appreciate what I've done for her because I never did anything for her. Okay, so that give, was my next question. What, what have you done for her? Nothing? Other than give her advice and care about her. Be a big brother that loves her. Like, Would you say Wendy's a little bit spoiled? Um, in, some, in some regards, I mean, she gets a lot of help for sure. Is she a little less savvy about how the world works than you are? I don't know. I mean, you got to ask her. Could you trust Wendy with a secret that could ruin your life? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a secret. It's something that would get me killed, so I, I didn't want to tell her. Can we agree that she obviously knew something about this crime? She found out when she came to court. I, n- I never told her anything. I'm talking about the murder of Dan Markell. She knew something. Right? I mean, it's not a coincidence she went to the crime scene, is it? The, you're talking about the route that she took that day? I'm talking about her pulling up to the crime scene tape. She never she never went to the crime scene. She was going to buy a bottle of liquor that, coincidentally, the person sent her a stock the bar party for a, buy a bottle of bullet bourbon that she was going to pick up. She wasn't driving to a crime scene. And I think she made that clear, too. Nobody knew a murder was taking place. She pulled up to the crime scene tape, Dr. Adelson. She didn't pull up to the crime scene tape. She was driving down the street and then had to make a U-turn. It was blocked off. But she it's wasn't like going to. she couldn't to. help herself. Nobody it? knew a murder was going to take place. She exposed you all to some degree by those actions, didn't she? No. Not at and all. And then she threw you under the bus in her interview, didn't she? That nobody knew a murder was going to take place. She knew her husband had just been shot, and they were asking her who would want him dead, and she said your name. Are you mad about that? No, she said a lot of people's names. Well, she Not said yours in the first 25 pages of a five-hour interview. Isn't that true? I, I wasn't there for the interview. But you've reviewed it in preparation for your trial, haven't you? I actually don't know if I've seen her interview. And here is the dry humor that we can't leave out. And then on 2, 19 and 14, Donna texts you again to tread lightly with Wendy and refers to Dan Markell as an asshole and a fucker, right? Sorry. You made me laugh. Sorry. That's what Um, I'm here for. Is that what happened, that text? Did my mom use a, a foul word to describe him? Yes, sir. Asshole and fucker, to be specific. Um, she she used a curse word, correct. Is that pretty strong language for your mom, or is that how she speaks? Um, I mean, it it, it is pretty strong language, but I think in, uh, I mean, I've been called a lot worse. His face gets me. Why is this so funny to him? He's enjoying this. 
He's, he's acting like a child. It, he is a child. It reminds me of when I was in a criminal law class. I admit my professor introduced the but for clause and I sent a mass text message to the class on iMessage because we had a connected one and I get kicked out for saying what's a but for <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm immature and I'm guilty of that. But this is a man on trial for murder and he's laughing when she says the word fucker like she he thinks it's funny. It's like what a child would do. But back to Charlie, he never went to any of Dan's memorials. And he said it was because he was feeling horrible. But he wasn't even close to him. He didn't even really like him. But he made it seem like it would have been too hard. Georgia wants to know when Charlie found out what exactly happened to Dan. And she also made sure to rub it in his face that his legal theories that he talked about at Dolce Vita to Katie were wrong and how his defense doesn't even make sense. Here's that now. Do you think everyone involved should be convicted? I think everyone involved should be convicted. Even the person that hired the hit? I think anybody who played a role in it, but I wasn't a part of it. Do you regret that Dan Markell suffered for 14 hours before he died? I feel horrible. He was supposed to die quickly, instantly, right? Are you asking me? I am. No, he wasn't supposed to die at all. This was horrible what happened. Did it surprise you that the cops were able to identify the Prius? Did it surprise me? Yes. I'm not a cop. I don't I don't know what how cops investigate. Did it surprise you to learn that it's it's not a requirement of law to put the person at the scene of the crime to be guilty of a crime? I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not a police detective. Was the police work in this case thorough? I'm sure, I'm sure the police did the best they could. Did you think that you had done everything properly such that you could never be detected or caught for this? I wasn't part of this murder at all. You have it wrong. Catherine Magbano has said that you think you're untouchable. Is that true, doctor? That's not true at all. Did your parents drop off money to you on the night of the murder? I never saw my parents there. You can look at our cell phones and you'll, you'll find that out, that we never saw each other. I uh, did look at the cell phones, and what is on there is your mom texts you, quote, outside your house. And no, I, I mean, think, look at the tower information. I think you testified that that meant she was just passing by on the roadway. She was yeah. approaching by the area, yeah, to see if I was home. Right. And do you know what your response was to her text? Yeah, like 20 or 30 minutes later, I said 10 minutes. I'm 10 minutes out, is what you said. I think I said 10 minutes, but yeah, I'm not home. Doesn't that indicate you're going to meet them at your house in 10 minutes? No, I, I told, told her to let me know when you're going to be in the area. Was the money that Catherine Magbanoa got damp? I never gave her any money that was damp. I, the money I gave her came out of my safe. Was it damp? No, I, I took it out of my safe. I put it on the dresser. She put it in her purse. Why did Garcia and Rivera, or whoever did it, I guess I should say, why did whoever did it need to kill someone to extort you? You gotta, you gotta ask them. Well, why, why couldn't they just come put a gun to your head and say, give me all the money and you're safe? Thank God they didn't. Thank God they didn't? Thank God they didn't. I would have gotten killed. If Garcia hated you, why would he drive to Tallahassee twice to kill someone you hated? He was, it sounds like he was part of the extortion or Katie put him up to it. Doesn't blackmail or extortion usually involve the extortionist having some kind of dirt on the victim? I know how this was done to me. I, I know what, I'm just telling you what happened to me. I don't, I'm not an expert in it. If they had come in and threatened to kill you, would you have given them the money in your safe? If someone came and put a gun to my head, and yeah, I would have opened up my safe and I would give them the money. I still don't get how killing Dan Markell advances the ball for them to extort money out of you. Do you? Yeah, I have a theory. They, they could extort me for life, and I don't think they knew exactly how much I had in the safe. I mean, she knew I had a lot of money in the safe. But this mm -hmm. way I could get extorted for life, and that's what happened. And I was paying, stuck paying $3,000 a month. But you could have gotten extorted for life? Just by the threat of death by Latin King, couldn't you, Doctor? I mean, this this was more this was as real of a threat as you get. I mean, these guys aren't messing around, right? 
Remember Lewis even said he was a jack boy. He liked to rob people. That would make a lot more sense than this long game of layaway, this long layaway plan. The prosecution cross-examination quickly dismantled Charlie's assertions that a man who hated him took out his mortal enemy and then extorted him for it. These are gang members. If they truly knew that Charlie had $333,000 in a safe, they would have robbed him and walked away without the threat of murder hanging over their head. Yeah, obviously. But wait, she's going to question him about the TV. Oh, that's right. This TV is going to be five. I was thinking that, you know what, it actually would be good if someone knows what happened in case I get killed. They at least know what direction to start looking in. So until that point, nobody even knew. So I just... When she started questioning me and questioning me and questioning me, I just said, you know what? I'm going to tell you, but don't say a thing to dad. Don't say a thing to Wendy. You got to promise me. I didn't want her to ever talk about this again. And that's that was the day that she found out is when I got the checks. What she doesn't say on the wire is it's happening again. I was approached by another extortionist today. Does she say that? No, she's talking very carefully. And you say carefully, but isn't carefully the same thing as code? No, they're two, two totally separate things. Do you know the difference? You weren't really giving her money for a TV, were you? Giving her money for a TV? This TV is probably going to be about five. Okay. I need you to bring cash tonight. I wish she picked another object on planet Earth other than TV. But TV is code for absolutely nothing. There is no code in this case involving TV. And you keep circling and circling and circling TV, you're wrong. Is it a coincidence that the repair of the TV that you bought Wendy as a divorce gift because it was cheaper than hiring a hitman is your sister's alibi for the murder and then your mom brings up TV first call on the wire? It's, it's not an alibi for a murder. She had a broken TV. you got to ask Lincoln who threw the remote at the TV. Was it a coincidence? Is the TV thing a coincidence? That's what I hear you say. Oh, that, that the repairman was there that day? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, that is a coincidence for sure. There's a and couple all, of all coincidences the, in this case. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I said there's a couple of coincidences in this case. I mean, she had people send her an email to go buy a bottle of bullet bourbon for their stock the bar party, and she was driving to a liquor store to buy a bottle of bullet bourbon on that day at that time, and her friend sent the email, and you have the email and evidence. Like, is that a coincidence? Yeah, coincidences happen. Do you think there is such thing as a coincidence? Because I just want to point out, she did buy bullet bourbon, supposedly on a invitation. And those people that were throwing the party couldn't have known that Dan was going to get shot that day. But she didn't have to go to ABC Liquor near Dan's house. That doesn't seem like a coincidence, but could there be? Sometimes seemingly unrelated events may align in unexpected ways. That's true. I mean, there have been coincidences. Of course, but I think it's natural to question the significance of such occurrences. That's true, especially in this case of a murder. And in the end, Georgia delivered the death blow to Charlie's case. Later in her closing argument, she spent two hours mapping every single detail out and connecting all the dots. It was so good. It was like a movie. It was so good that even though the defense had seven years to come up with a story to match all the evidence. And they had two previous trials to incorporate the witness testimony and try to sell a theory on the missing puzzle piece. It just didn't make sense because really every case has missing pieces. That's why the jury uses their common sense to review the evidence that they've been given and use it to determine which sets of facts leads to guilt or innocence. The defense used their closing arguments to remind the jury that Wendy was innocent of killing her husband, or even knowing he was going to be killed. But Wendy wasn't on trial. Why waste a minute on Wendy? Well, even the prosecution found it odd and mentioned in rebuttal, in addition to the fact that the law states that you cannot speculate about doubt, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. After an eight-day trial, the jury was finally sent into the deliberation room at the end of the day on November 6th, 2022. And it only took them about three hours to come up with a verdict. Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, Your Honor. If you please could hand the verdict form to the bailiff. The verdict form is in its proper order. Madam Clerk, please publish the verdict. In the circuit court of the Second Judicial Circuit in and for Leon County, Florida, the state of Florida versus Charles Adelson, case number 2016, CF3036B, verdict. Count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the indictments, first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. 
Count two. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two of the indictment, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Count three. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three of the indictment, solicitation to commit first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of solicitation to commit first-degree murder. So say we all this sixth day of November, 2023. Wow. It actually seemed like Charlie was surprised. Yeah. I think he really expected to win and be acquitted even. I guess the maestro couldn't orchestrate his fate on this one. I mean, I'm not surprised it didn't take him that long to convict Charlie Adelson for Dan Markell's murder. Charlie was sentenced on December 11th, 2023. Both Dan's parents gave moving victim impact statements. Phil Markell stated that losing their son was horrific enough. But to lose access to both their grandsons was a heavy heartbreak. Especially because Wendy changed the children's middle names and last names. The Adelsons made sure the boys had zero ties to their father or his family. He thanked the prosecution team and the judge for their hard work and time. Then he asked the court to give Charlie the maximum sentence allowable by law. Charlie, known for his love of talking, went for a minimalist statement. He told the court, quote, I would just like to say that I maintain my innocence. Wait, I have to actually see him and hear him say that because I actually forget that he said that. So let's play that clip. Mr. Adelson, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make a statement if you wish. You do not have to speak. However, this is your opportunity if you choose to do so. I do. You may stand. Sam. I would just like to say that I maintain my innocence. Well, Judge Everett sentenced Charlie to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Dan's murder. Please rise. I'm now going to pronounce the sentence. With the jury having found you guilty of all three counts that you were charged with in your indictment, of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and solicitation to commit first-degree murder. I am going to adjudicate you guilty of all three at this time, and you are going to be sentenced as follows. As to count one, the first-degree murder count pursuant to section 782.04 and 775.082 for the statutes, you are sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole. As to count two, you are going to be sentenced consecutively to 30 years in the Department of Corrections for conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. As to count three, you are going to be sentenced to 30 years in the Department of Corrections consecutively for solicitation to commit first-degree murder. I guess Ryan won his bets, too. He said life plus, and that's exactly what Charlie got. And that was what was given to his old pal. And while Dan's friends and family were pleased with the outcome, they believed that other members of the Adelson family were also responsible for Dan's death. Georgia Kappelman told the press to stay tuned for future arrests. And it turns out they wouldn't have to wait long. We have that clip, and I love her confidence here. Somebody's got to ask a question. How are you feeling? Georgia? Ms. Kappelman? I'm feeling thrilled. I'm feeling relieved. I'm feeling like a lot of hard work has come. Is this the last prosecution we're going to see in the Dan Markell murder, or will there be others? I don't know the answer to that question yet. So stay tuned. I love that clip because of what comes next. But before we get there, we have to mention something else. Donna Adelson spent 35 hours. That's right. 35 hours on the phone with her son, Charlie, while he was incarcerated. In the seven days following Charlie Adelson's conviction, Donna spent 2,118 minutes talking to her son. And all of those calls were recorded and prosecutors found them extremely interesting. According to arrest records, Donna spoke to Charlie about getting things in order, and making sure her grandchildren were taken care of. She also spoke about self-harm as a solution to her problems, or alternatively, traveling to a country that does not have an extradition treaty with the United States to avoid culpability. And I wonder why she was suggesting such extreme 
measures. I'm being sarcastic, of course. We know why. On one phone call that I found extremely interesting was one of the first ones Charlie made after his trial. It was all about how his little sister really messed things up for him. Or was he defending her? Let's listen. Combine that with, with all the other stuff that he got mm-hmm. when he's showing up at the crime scene an hour after it happens by chance. After she talks to her mom and her brother that one. Couldn't help herself. Kaplan gave the facts and gave a lot of a logical explanation that I guess ninety nine out of a hundred times you'd have to say that would have to be the case. I don't buy I don't buy when these answers go into a liquor path before closer liquor stores or why don't you just take a more direct route? Four liquor stores, I think, an undirect route to go to a liquor store further away so she could drive by the house an hour after that. I mean, it's one in 10,000. One in 10,000, she's telling the truth. And you can, you know, when they say, like, beyond a reasonable doubt, yeah. if she showed up on purpose at that place at that time, then he's guilty. That's, that's almost like corroborating evidence. <laughs> I really think that's how they speak. I really think that's how someone can easily, easily, easily look at everything, come up with that hard, very hard, hard to explain back, and then like, and then say, stop telling me I'm stupid and you're so smart. You'll write another book. What'd she say in the book? I mean, she basically she was putting down Tallahassee in her book. She was foreshadowing some place that they were stuck in. Maybe it's like they took my sister's book that she wrote that's got nothing to do with this case. And they spun it to like the little Tallahassee. Like she made up an imaginary town, but it sounded the name it sounded close to Tallahassee. Somewhere on the way to nowhere. You know, like you saw it when they were talking when they were talking about her book, almost like she was you know, she was using the book to put down Tallahassee. Like what the fuck does her book have anything to do with the case? It's not that. Everything that she brought in has nothing to do with the case. But it, it was, like, spun. And, yeah, I, I see what it looks like. She's, she's shooting on Tallahassee in her book. Like, yeah, it was just painting a picture. Painting a picture. I mean, you trust me, but this, this was not... She wasn't putting on a trial. She was putting on a show. You know, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, I, I thought it was going to be more fact based than, than like show taking. Yeah, only one side had facts, the other side was just blatant, blatant nonsense and lies. I think Charlie and his mom know the reason that Wendy was where she was that day. But Charlie also mentioned, that Wendy knew that route, it was familiar to her, and he's kind of defending her. But he also made comments about how Georgia and Sarah appealed to the Southern residents of Florida, how they were both using y'all, and that his attorney, coming from Miami, probably wasn't the best idea. He didn't connect with the locals. The prosecution listened to every minute of those phone calls, hoping for a disclosure they could use in prosecuting other unindicted members of the conspiracy to kill Dan Markell. Because of this diligence, they flagged the Adelson's passports in case they followed through any one of these plans. As a result, prosecutors were alerted to some exciting travel plans. Yeah, some very interesting travel plans indeed. And coincidental ones, or not coincidental, depending. Well, Donna and Harvey Adelson purchased a one-way ticket to Dubai with a connecting flight to Vietnam for November 13th, 2023. And guess what? There is no extradition policy between Vietnam and the United States. Because of these travel plans, the prosecution's hand was forced to act earlier than initially prepared. Instead of traveling first class, Donna and Harvey were met at the Miami airport where Donna Adelson was arrested on charges of conspiracy to commit murder and first degree murder of Dan Markell. Yes, I like couldn't wait for you to stop because I was like, finally. And yes, we must play that clip. She looked shocked and watch how she tried to keep her cell phone. Yeah, I and wonder I, what's in there. Me too. I wonder what treasures police will find in that thing. Oh, 
Why do I have to watch you? This is evidence. Do me a favor. She's under arrest. Oh, I have to go with you. I have to go. I have to look at you. You don't have to go with me. I'm helping you. 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 I'm is that okay with you? And please don't hate me for this. I beg you, but I have a heart. And in no way is what I'm about to say diminishing the disgust that I have for this family. But because of Harvey and Donna's age, a part of me, a very small part of me, felt some weird sympathy when Donna was begging the police to let her husband get home. And I hate seeing anyone upset. It's just my empathetic part. So it kind of pulled on my heartstrings when I was watching Harvey kiss Donna and he didn't want to be her to be taken away, but she chose this. So I have no sympathy in the end, none. But I do have emotions, of course. But also, did you notice how they were like ripping her jewelry off of her fingers? One officer was like yanking Donna's rings off. Once Donna was put into a police car, she asked for water. Then she had to be bottle fed. <laughs> Which was humiliating. And I think it will be one of many very humbling moments for this well-to-do woman. I'm sure of that. Because actually, in a funny twist, the next day she has her first court appearance and she's wearing a green anti-self-harm vest in front of Judge Mindy Glazier. And if you're not from South Florida, like I am, this may not mean much to you, but I had to laugh because Judge Glazier is seen on TV a lot locally and also in a show called Chaos in Court, which is an in-depth examination of some of the most stunning and emotional courtroom moments caught on camera. She's kind of like a modern day Judge Judy, and she just went viral not too long ago all over the internet because she recognized a former classmate from middle school when he came before her for a court appearance. His name is Arthur Booth. He was being charged with multiple counts of burglary I want to play that clip for you now. Most of you have seen this before, and it is kind of one of those very emotional moments. Mr. Booth, I have a question for you. I yes, ma'am. Did you go to Nautilus for middle school? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry oh. to see you there. I always wondered what happened to you, sir. Oh, my goodness. This is the nicest kid <laughs> in middle school. Oh, my goodness. He was the best kid in middle school. I used to play football with him, all the kids, and look what has happened. I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. Mr. Booth, I hope you were able to change your ways. Good luck to you. Oh my goodness. What's sad is how old we've become. Oh my goodness. Good luck to you, sir. I hope you were able to come out of this okay and just lead a lawful life. Arthur is said to have changed his whole life around after this encounter with Judge Mindy Glazier. Well, because Donna was arrested in Miami-Dade, she appeared before Judge Mindy Glazier. And I had to laugh because she probably wouldn't have had this recorded if she had not found herself in that exact courtroom on November 11th of just last year in 2023. Donna is among all of these other inmates being sworn in that day. After many other inmates went ahead of her, it was finally Donna's turn. I don't think Judge Glazier knew who the heck Donna was. She had a private attorney with her, unlike some of the other inmates, and she even pronounced Donna's last name incorrectly. Let's watch. I think the private attorney is present for Donna Adelson on the in-state fugitive warrant. Can you promote her? So I'll call that first. So calling up Donna Adelson is a private attorney. Ma'am, you were arrested on a warrant from Leon County, Florida. The charges are public order crimes. It says attempted solicitation, conspiracy to commit a capital felony, homicide, willful, it says homicide, but maybe attempted homicide, I'm sorry. Attempted solicitation or conspiracy to commit homicide. It looks like two counts of that. So your attorney is here. There is Donna just waiting in her green vest. Donna's attorney seemed a bit confused. She was asking for extradition, but it was an in-state warrant. 
Good morning, Your Honor. Marisol Descalzo on behalf of Donna Adelson. Uh, we are going to waive extradition to uh, Leon County. It's, a, it's an in-state warrant, which means, so basically we have a warrant from Leon County. It sounds like really serious charges. They have up to 15 days to come and pick you up. The reset date here is uh, November 29th to make sure you get picked up. So Ms. Del Caso, what you can do is reach out to Leon County, the prosecutor's office there, and see if they'll agree to a bond. If they do agree to a bond, you're welcome to contact Ms. F. She can send you a sample order we use. And with that order, um, we can sign. Because I think it's unlikely there's going to be an agreement on this. It's a solicitation case. Anyway, okay, so you want to hear something funny though? She looks like a lady that was on my airplane yesterday. Did you come in from Paris? I did not. <laughs> I wish. She looks like a lady who's on the airplane with me for real. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but Judge Glazier was like, you know, she looks like a lady that was on my plane yesterday. I wonder I thought, if she really was. I don't think so, because she's like, did you just come in from Paris? And she was like, oh, I wish. Mm. I don't think Donna knew that this was being recorded. She's like, oh, I wish. It's like, I'm sure you did. On December 11th, 73-year-old Donna Adelson was arraigned in front of the same judge who sentenced her son Charlie to life in prison a month earlier, Judge Everett. And Donna wasn't exactly on her best behavior. Her lawyer, Ms. Descalzo, had filed a motion claiming Donna's treatment in jail had been inhumane and that the jail wasn't allowing Donna to speak with an attorney privately to prepare for her defense. Of course, the judge had some questions and comments as well. Mrs. Adelson continues unable to participate in her defense. She's not permitted any papers. I cannot mail her anything. Uh, I did have a call with her on Friday but only because Mrs. Kappelman facilitated it for me. And on that call, it was not a private call. Uh, Ms. Adelson was forced to put me on speakerphone with guards listening. Um, there, is, there is just no way that Mrs. Adelson can prepare for her defense in this manner. All right, there, there is one question that I had specifically as to this issue. And I noticed within your pleading that you had quotes from your client and also some observations of what has been taking place with the correctional staff. Are you alleging that you have no ability to access your client or that there is limited contact with your client? No, Your Honor, I'm not saying that there is no ability. Um, the direct observations that are contained within my motion were not observed by myself, uh, but Daniel Rashbaum, uh, Charlie Adelson's attorney, had a visit with Charlie Adelson and he was able to swap it out for Miss Donna Adelson. Uh, the week of, I think, November 27th or 28th. So he was able to have that conversation with her in person. Um, I've had a conversation with her, like I said, over the phone. Um, I have been told um, that I can do a 60 minute increment visit with her in person. Um, there is no video visitation ability. Um, so I would say that my ability to meet with her is limited. It's not non-existent, um, however, my ability to share, for example, discovery, paperwork, this motion, the motion I filed with Ms. Adelson um, is non-existent because she's not permitted to have paper. You heard that Donna isn't even allowed to have paper. Well, there's a reason for that. Donna, as you know, had mentioned self-harm in the past on a phone call with Charlie and also when she was arrested. So she was under surveillance in jail. Her level of confinement and restrictions put on her is to ensure her own safety. Here's a representative from the jail explaining this. And also Donna's outburst where Judge Everett has to scold her. As far as this particular issue goes, there is no impediment to her speaking with her lawyer, seeing her lawyer over and above using a tablet. The tablet has a headset that can be used as a ligature. Um, otherwise, she's free to enter the jail. Uh, Chief Mack is here. He's assured me that they can have a visit. I don't understand the problem that um, is perceived, but there is no impediment to an attorney-client visitation. The level of confinement and also the current restrictions that are in place, are these because there were, at some point, statements alluding to self-harm during the jail phone calls? And at booking here. When she was booked into the jail here, she made a statement that she wanted to die. Now, before she was arrested in Miami, she also had a phone call with her son, who's obviously in jail here. 25-minute phone call. I personally listened to it. She um, very clearly 
spoke about a plan to kill herself using sleeping pills. If One moment, Ms. Adelson, please keep your comments to yourself. Let your lawyer argue on your behalf. Spoke of a plan to kill herself if she could not escape the country before arrest. In some cases, defendants who are considered a risk to themselves or others may be provided with special garments or restraints to prevent self-harm or harm to others. These measures are typically implemented based on an assessment of the individual's mental health. In general, if a defendant is deemed to be a risk to themselves, court officials might take steps to ensure the safety of the individual and the safety of others in the courtroom. This could involve the use of special clothing, as we see Donna wearing, or other security measures. Because Donna made those comments about self-harm, she was subjected to these extra measures of personal safety. But Donna saw this as an exercise in humiliation. And we told you she would experience many instances where she would be humbled. This woman who threatened to flee the country and who was then found with a one-way ticket to a country without a U.S. extradition policy believes that she should be placed on house arrest and not have to be put in jail at all. The arrogance of this woman to mastermind the murder of her grandchildren's father and be granted the special privilege of house arrest is truly astounding that she believes she's entitled to it. It goes right over my head because I'm like, who even tries to assert that? The Adelsons. Exactly. Recall we mentioned her attorney filing a motion. Let's go into this because as Kimber said, it's pretty astounding. Donna's attorney, Marisol Descalzo, filed an emergency motion on Tuesday, December 5th, 2023, before this court appearance, and she cited numerous complaints of allegations of cruel and unusual punishment. When Donna was first arrested at the Miami International Airport, she was transported to the Miami County Jail. Donna has complaints ranging from travel-related trauma during her travel back to Tallahassee to the treatment by guards and the staff. Donna's attorney doesn't believe that she is at risk of self-harm and is requesting an independent psychological evaluation or release to house arrest. She believes her client's Sixth Amendment rights are being violated because Donna cannot communicate with her attorney and assist with her defense. The motion requests explicitly that Donna be housed in a general population where she can have access to communication with both her family and attorneys. But the most enormous ask is just as egregious as believing that you have the right to murder someone for inconveniencing your access to your grandchildren. Exactly. Donna believes, as we mentioned, that she has the right to be placed on house arrest, despite being arrested while allegedly trying to flee to a non-extradition country. Her attorneys allege that the evidence against Donna is circumstantial at best. That TV is going to be five. <laughs> they have reminded the court that Donna has a presumption of innocence is entitled to a fair trial, has a right to counsel, and has the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. Poor Donna. She finds jail <laughs> to be cruel. Maybe Donna should have thought of that before all of that. Yeah, especially because Donna believes the special precautions taken to keep her safe are not up to her standards, <laughs> standards of living. Like, uh, of course not. It's laughable. No one promised prison was going to be comfortable. And once Donna arrived at the Miami-Dade County Jail, she was placed in a psychiatric unit because of the charges against her. And this was their standard custom and practice. Donna was placed in an isolation cell with a small sink, a mattress on the floor, a blanket, and access to a toilet. But she was not allowed access to clothing, cups, silverware, books, or toiletries, and was only allowed to shower one time. The motion goes on to allege that she was not allowed to use the phone or speak with family members. After 96 hours, she was evaluated by two psychiatrists and then transferred to general population, where she was finally able to have contact with her family. But... This all changed on November 20th, 2023, when Donna was then transferred from Miami, because remember, we're going to Leon County to Tallahassee. So then she was placed back to a transport vehicle without water or snacks. The motion goes on to state that there were several hours into the journey where Donna tried to get the attention of an officer because she needed water 
and she needed to use the restroom, but that she was not able to get their attention. Approximately four to five hours into the trip is when officers finally, allegedly, finally checked on Donna, and she was shaking, dehydrated, and unable to stand or move. And as a result, the officers had to call paramedics at a rest stop. Now, things only got worse for Donna once she arrived at the Leon County Jail. Because she requested paramedics, she was placed in the jail infirmary under direct observation, which she should be because if you're having dehydration and you're and you're not doing well and you're old, 73 years old, like that to me doesn't seem unreasonable. But this consisted of a small solitary unit with a toilet, sink, and mattress, and what they allege was a dirty blanket. You're in prison. Like, they might not have blankets to go around. But when she requested reading material, she was denied. Apparently, the motion stated that she was also required to eat with her hands. The next day, she was questioned by mental health officials about her medical condition and any medications she was taking before her arrest. According to the motion, Donna felt uncomfortable during this interaction because she could not see the official's face and wanted to verify that this person was an authorized healthcare professional. Can you imagine? You're like, I need to see you. I need to make sure. I mean, I kind of understand that, but like, what rights do you have in prison? According to Donna, the healthcare professional took offense to these questions and allegedly stated, you are a fancy white lady who murdered her son and now thinks she has rights. Wow. Then the official reportedly joked with the guard stating, she will learn that fancy white lady murderers have no rights here. Dang, but like nobody has rights there. Then while addressing Donna, the worker allegedly stated, do you see where you are and do you see where I am? I'm out here because I'm not a murderer. Donna's attorney alleges that since that interaction, the jail staff has treated Donna with cruelty. They allege that Donna has also been denied access to her necessary blood pressure medication and has been prevented from showering for days at a time. Because she is still housed in the solitary unit, she has only been permitted one five-minute phone call with her husband. The motion goes on to allege that a psychiatrist working at the jail told Donna she no longer belongs in a solitary unit. Donna is alleging that her treatment is cruel and inhumane. Her attorneys allege that being placed in a solitary unit interferes with her Sixth Amendment rights to participate in her defense. Based on those grounds, they want the court to grant Donna house arrest. Why do inmates think they deserve anything at all? Because sometimes I even say, especially if the crime is unusually like heinous, like the one out in Kansas City right now this past week or so where the mother put her one-month-old baby in an oven and burned her to death, I sometimes say that I think the same thing should be done to those criminals. And you might not agree, but if there were harsher punishments, people would think twice. Oh, an eye for an eye. And Donna is complaining about what she eats, how she eats, the phone calls. Hmm, that seems pretty petty considering Dan can no longer breathe but that's just me being passionate about victims getting the justice they deserve. But her attorneys believe that Donna is a crucial component in preparing her defense. They're alleging her detention conditions are unconstitutionally punitive. And for those reasons, in addition to her cruel and inhumane treatment, the judge should grant her the request. Donna's motion for house arrest was denied, which is not surprising. However, The judge did order a full psychological evaluation to determine if she should be moved out of that solitary unit. The motion may have brought a sense of justice to the family and friends of Dan Markell to know that the mastermind behind his murder is complaining about the conditions of her incarceration. And as I said, perhaps she should have thought about those things, actually you said it, before she did this, before she casually planned a murder that has ricocheted into countless untold suffering. We know from Charlie's trial that Donna has been described as a sociopath and a malignant narcissist. These are non-professional opinions of those who have met her. A malignant narcissist is a term that is sometimes used to describe a specific and severe form of narcissistic personality disorder. For the record, as far as we know, Donna has never been diagnosed with any of these afflictions, but let's look at the definition anyway. Even though we are not professionals, I think we are intelligent enough to examine the disorders and simply think about what we have observed thus far. It's a disorder categorized by a pervasive pattern of grandiosity and a constant need for admiration and a lack of empathy for others. These types of people are often described as individuals 
who not only have an inflated sense of self-importance, but also engage in manipulative and exploitative behaviors. They may be more likely to harm others to achieve their goals, and their behavior can have severe consequences for those around them. An argument can be made that some of these things describe the actions of Donna Adelson. Exactly. And we're not doctors, we're not psychiatrists or psychologists, but an argument can certainly be made that this woman fits the mold. We know from many emails introduced during Charlie's trial and others that Donna was controlling and manipulative, and she lacked empathy for anyone who stood between her and her demands. Donna desired that Wendy and her two grandchildren live with her in Miami. She had no concern or regret for pressuring her son Charlie to get involved in a murder-for-hire conspiracy to kill Dan Markell. Her actions cost her son his freedom. Charlie has a five-year-old son. She's taken another father away from another grandson. She has no concern or regret in murdering the father of her first two grandsons as it held no significance to her own life. She wants to get her way. And as if a father could be replaced by a grandmother, she has no concern or regret in casting a shadow around her daughter's name for the rest of her life. Going forward, there will always be those who believe that Wendy was involved in Dan's murder. That will affect every aspect of her life from dating to employment. And Donna had no concern or regret for the long-term suffering and psychological trauma that she's inflicted on Dan Markell's two sons. Now, her only concerns are for herself once again, because she finds jail insufferable. She's had someone murdered so that she could have daily contact with Dan's sons. Yet when her freedom is in jeopardy, she's so easily prepared to abandon the family that she had killed for. When it came down to it, Donna only truly values herself. And in a final act of self-preservation, she was ready to leave behind everything and everyone she spent a lifetime trying to control. How tragically ironic is that? Like she was ready to flee and not even have contact with them anymore if it meant that she and her husband could have freedom. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It makes perfect sense. There's so much more to come for Donna. So much has yet to be revealed, but we aren't going to go any further for now. However, I want to mention, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but our friends, Derek and Stephanie, they've also been covering this case in a major deep dive. I will leave their channel below and in the cards if you haven't checked it out. I think they're on part eight. And this last part went further than we have today, I'm assuming. I didn't watch it yet, about Donna herself. So if you want to check that out, I highly recommend Crime Weekly, which is their podcast. In the meanwhile, we shall wait until Donna's day in court. And when that happens, we will do an update and that will go into the Dan Markell playlist here on this channel. And what do you think is going to happen to Wendy? Oh boy, that's going to be another video that we will do when that happens. I, I really do think she's going to be arrested. I just found out in another trial I'm watching, that they can pull information from WhatsApp. And it's been mentioned multiple times that Wendy and Charlie both had WhatsApp. So I'm thinking, in my mind, of course, where else would I be thinking, that they are going to find some incriminating evidence inside the WhatsApp. Well, next week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming with a very compelling and interesting and crazy case. Yes. So thank you all so very much for being here with us today. And we hope that you stay tuned and subscribe if you haven't done so already and push the notification bell so you don't miss out on our next episode. Thanks Thanks so so much. much, And and we'll we'll see you in our our next next video. video. Bye. Bye.